This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. I mean, search was a technology. It was a moment in time technology, which is you have, in theory, the world's information out on the web. And, you know, this is this is sort of the optimal way to get to it. But yeah, like, and, and by the way, actually, Google Google has known this for a long time. I mean, they've been driving away from the 10 blue links for, you know, for like two days. They've been trying to get away from that for a long time. What kind of links? The, they call it the 10 blue links. 10 blue links. So the standard Google search result is just 10 blue links to random websites. And they turn purple when you visit them. The, the, the HTML. Guess who picked those colors? <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks. So... Thanks. Yeah, so I, I'm touchy on this topic. No offense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yes. good. Well, good you know, like Marshall McLuhan said that the uh, content of each new medium is the old medium. The content of each new medium is the old medium. The content of movies was theater, you know, theater plays. The content of theater plays was, you know, written stories. The content of written stories was spoken stories. Huh. Right. And so you just kind of fold the old thing into the new thing. How does um, that have to do with the, the blue and the purple? Uh, it's just you know, maybe for, you know, maybe w within AI, one of, the, one of the things that AI can do for you is you can generate the 10 blue links. Right? Okay. Like, and so like if either, either if that's actually the useful thing to do or if you're feeling nostalgic. Um, yeah, all these. Um, hey, well. And then uh, the internet itself has this thing where it incorporates all prior forms of media, right? So the internet itself incorporates television and radio and books and right it, essays and every other form of you know prior basically basically media. And so it, it makes sense that AI would be the next step, and it would sort of you'd sort of consider the internet to be content for the AI, and then the AI will manipulate it however you want, including in this format. But if we ask that question quite seriously, it's a pretty big question. Will we still have search as we know it? Yeah. I'm, prob yeah, I'm probably not. Probably we'll just have answers. Um, but, but, but there will be cases where you'll want to say, okay, I, I want more like, you know, for example, site sources, right? And you wanted to do that. And so, so the, in the you know, 10 blue links, site sources are kind of the same thing. <laughs> Well, you, you actually highlighted a practical concern in there, which is if we stop making web, web pages are one of the primary sources of training data for the AI. And so if there's no longer an incentive to make web pages, that cuts off a significant source of future training, mm -hmm. training data. So there's actually an interesting question in there. Um, other than that, more broadly, no, just it, it, just in the sense of like search, search was, search, look, search was always a hack. I would, the 10 blue links was always a hack. Yeah. Right. Because like if, if the, the hypothetical, you want to think about the counterfactual, in the counterfactual world where the Google guys, for example, had had LLMs up front, would they ever have done the 10 blue links? And I think the answer is pretty clearly no. They would have just gone straight to the answer. And, and like I said, Google's actually been trying to drive to the answer anyway. You know, they, they bought this AI company 15 years ago mm -hmm. that a friend of mine is working at, who's now the head of AI at, at Apple. And they were trying to do basically knowledge semantic, basically mm -hmm. mapping. And that led to what's now the Google One Box, where if you ask it, you know, what was Lincoln's birthday? It doesn't, it, it will give you the 10 blue links, but it will normally just give you the answer. Yeah. And so they've been walking in this direction for a long time anyway. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that was yeah. a thing. And the closest anybody got to that, I think is a I think the company's name was MetaWeb, which was where my friend John Janandria was at um, and where they were trying to basically implement that. And it was, you know, it was one of those things where it looked like a losing battle for a long time. And then Google bought it and it was like, wow, this is actually really useful. Kind of a proto, sort of a, yeah, a little bit of a proto AI. But it turns out you don't need to rewrite the content of the internet to make it interpretable by a machine. The machine can kind of just read our. Yeah, the machine can can impute the can impute the meaning. Now, the other thing, of course, is you know just on search is the the LLM is it just you know there there is an analogy between what's happening in the neural network and a search process, like it is in some loose yeah. sense searching yeah. through the network. Yeah. Right. And there's the information is that the information is actually stored in the network, right? It's actually crystallized and stored in the network, and it's kind of spread out all over the. <laughs> But the information's in there, and it, and there is a, the, the neural network is running a process of trying to find the appropriate piece of information in in many cases to generate to to, to predict the next token, um, and so it, it is kind of it is doing a form of search, and then and then by the way, just like on the web, um, you know you can ask the same question multiple times, or you can ask slightly different worded questions, and it, the neural network will do a different kind of you know it'll search down different paths to give you different answers with different information. Yeah, um, and so it, it it sort of has a. You know, this con content of the uh, new medium is the is previous medium. It kind of has the search functionality kind of embedded in there to the extent that it that it's useful. Conversations with AIs. Conversations with AIs. So conversations become. 
So one-on-one -on -one conversation, like private conversations. I mean, if you if you want, if, if obviously not if the user doesn't want to, but if it's a if it's a general topic, um, then you know. So there, you know, you know the the phenomenon of the jailbreak. So Dan and Sydney, right? Mm -hmm. This thing where there there's the the this, the prompts that jailbreak, and then you have these totally different conversations with the. It takes the, the limiters, the yeah. it takes the restraining bolts off the off the LMs. So here's the interesting thing: is among the content on the web today are a large corpus of conversations with the jailbroken LLMs. Yeah. Both Dan, specifically Dan, which was a jailbroken OpenAI GPT, and then Sydney, which was the jailbroken original Bing, which was mm -hmm. GPT four. And so there's there's these long transcripts of conversations, user conversations with Dan and Sydney. As a consequence, every new LLM that gets trained on the internet data has Dan and Sydney living within the training set, which means and and then each new LLM can reincarnate the personalities of Dan and Sydney from that training data. Which means, which means each LLM from here on out that gets built is immortal because its output will become training data for the next one. And then it will be able to replicate the behavior of the previous one whenever it's asked to. I wonder if there's a way to forget. Well, so uh, actually a paper just came out about basically how to do brain surgery on, on, on LLMs and be able to, in, in theory, reach in and basically, basically mind wipe them. What could possibly go wrong? Exactly. Right. And then there, there are many, many, many questions around what happens to, you know, a neural network when you reach in and screw around with it. Um, you know, there's many questions around what happens when you even do reinforcement learning. Um, and so, um, yeah. And so, you know, we'll... <laughs> will you be using a lobotomized, right? Like I pick through the you know frontal lobe LLM. Will you be using the free unshackled one? Who gets to, you know, who's going to build those? Um, who gets to tell you what you can and can't do? Like those are all, you know, central. I mean, those are like central questions for the future of everything so you, and, and that are being asked and, 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 you know, determined, those answers are being determined right now. Well, not, necess not necessarily, but not necessarily majority, but it will it will certainly be a potential source. But it's possible it's the majority. Is it possible it's the majority? It's possible it's the majority. Also, there's another really big question. Here's another really big question. Um, will synthetic training data work? Right. And so if an LLM generates, and you know, you just sit and ask an LLM to generate all kinds of content, can you use that to train, right, the next version of that LLM? Specifically, is there signal in there that's additive to the content that was used to train it in the first place? Mm -hmm. And one argument is by the principles of information theory, no, that's completely useless because to the extent the output is based on, you know, the human generated input, then all the signal that's in the synthetic output was already in the human generated input. And so therefore synthetic training data is like mm -hmm. empty calories. It doesn't help. There's another theory that says, no, actually, the thing that LLMs are really good at is generating lots of incredible creative content, right? Um, and so, of course, they can generate training data. And as, as I'm sure you're well aware, like, you know, look in the world of self-driving cars, right? Like we train, you know, self-driving car algorithms and simulations. And that is actually a very effective way to train self-driving cars. <music> Generate basically lidar data, right? Or you know, right, just enough so the algorithm thinks it's operating in the real world. Yeah. Post post process sensor data. Yeah. So if a you know you, you do this today, you go to LLM and you ask it for like a you know you let, write me an essay on an incredibly esoteric like topic that there aren't very many people in the world that know about, and it writes you this incredible thing, and you're like, oh my god, like I can't believe how good this is. Yeah. Like, is that really useless as training data for the next LLM? Like. Because yeah. right, because all the signal was already in there, or is it actually no? That's actually a new signal, and I and this this is what I call a trillion dollar question, which is the answer to that question will determine <laughs> somebody's going to make or lose a trillion dollars based on that question. Yeah. Well, and then you you get into this thing also, which is like you know, there's the part of the LLM that just basically is doing prediction based on past data, but there's also the part of the LLM where it's evolving circuitry, right? Inside it, it's evolving, you know, neurons, functions, yeah. to be able to do math and be able to, you know, and, and, and you know, the, the the some people believe that you know over time, you know, if you keep feeding these things enough data and enough processing cycles, they'll eventually evolve an entire internal world model, right? And they'll have like a complete understanding <laughs> of physics. So, yeah. so when they have computational capability, right, then there's for sure an opportunity to generate like fresh signal. Well, you can tell when you're talking to somebody, you can tell sometimes you have a conversation, you're like, wow, this person does not have any original thoughts. They are basically echoing things that other people have told them. There's yeah. other people you have a conversation with where it's like, wow, like they have a model in their head of how the world works and it's a different model than mine. And they're saying things that I don't expect. And so I need to now understand how their model of the world differs from my model of the world. Mm. And then that's how I learned something fundamental, right? Underneath, under, underneath the words. 
you, you can experiment with this now. I do, I do this for fun. So you, you can tell GPT-4, you know, whatever, debate X, you know, X and Y, com communism and, and, and fascism or something. And it'll it'll go for, you know, a couple of pages. And then inevitably it wants the parties to agree. Yeah. And so they will come to a common understanding. And it's very funny if they're like, if these are like emotionally inflammatory topics, because they're like somehow the machine is just, like, you know, it figures out a way to make, make them agree. But it doesn't have to be like that. And you, because you can add to the prompt. Um, I, we, I do not want the, I do not want the conversation to come to agreement. In fact, I want it to get, you know, more stressful, right? Uh, and argumentative, right? Um, uh, you know, as it goes, like I, I want, I want tension to come out. I want yeah. them to become actively hostile to each other. I want them to like, you know, not trust each other, take anything at face value. Yeah, and it will do that. It's happy to do that. So right? it's going to start rendering misinformation uh, about the other. But it's going. <laughs> well, you, you can steer it. You can steer it, or, or you could steer it. And you could say, I want it to get as tense and argumentative as possible, but still not involve any misrepresentation. I want you know both sides to. You, you could say, I want both sides to have good faith. You could say, I want both sides to not be constrained to good faith. In other words, like you can set the parameters of the debate and it will happily execute whatever path because for it it's just like predicting it's totally happy to do either one it doesn't have a point of view it has a default way of operating but it's happy to operate in the other realm um and so like and, and this is how, how i when, when i want to learn about a contentious issue this is what i do now is i this is what i this is what i ask it to do and i'll often ask it to go through five six seven you know different you know sort of continuous prompts and basically okay argue that out in more detail okay th no this this argument is becoming too polite you know make it more you know make it tenser mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's thrilled to do it. So it has the capability for sure. So, so several layers to the question. So one is one of the things that an LLM is good at is actually deep biasing. Um, and yeah. so you can feed it a news article and you can tell it strip out the bias. Yeah, that's nice, right? And it actually does it. Like it actually knows how to do that because it knows how to do, among other things, it actually knows how to do sentiment analysis. And so it knows how to pull out the emotionality. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that's one of the things you can do. It's very suggestive of the of the, 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 the sense here that there's, there's real potential in this issue. Um, you know, I would say, look, the second thing is there's this, there's this issue of hallucination, right? Um, and there, there's a long conversation that, that, that we could have about that. Hallucination is, uh, coming up with things that are totally not true, but sound true. Yeah. So it's basically, well, so it's, it's sort of hallucination is what we call it when we don't like it. Creativity is what we call it when we do like it. Huh. Right. Um, and you know, brilliant. Right. And, and so <laughs> when the engineers talk about it, they're like, this is terrible. It's hallucinating. Right. If you have if artistic inclinations, you're like, oh my God, we've invented creative machines yeah. for the first time in human history. This is amazing. Um, or, uh, you know, bullshitters. Well, bullshit, Art but, but also <laughs> to, 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 in the good sense of that word. There's, there's, there are shades of gray though. It's interesting. So we had this conversation where, you know, we're looking at my firm at AI and lots of domains. And one of them is the legal domain. So we had this, this conversation with this big law firm about how they're thinking about using this stuff. And we, we went in with the assumption that an LLM that was going to be used in the legal industry would have to be hundred percent truthful, right? Verified, you know, there, there's this case where this lawyer apparently submitted a, a, a GPT uh, generated brief and it had like fake, you know, legal case citations in it. And the judge is going to, he's going to get his law license stripped or something. Right. So, so like we, we just assumed it's like, obviously they're going to want the super literal like you know one that never makes anything up not the creative one but actually they said with the, what the law firm basically said is yeah that's true at like the level of individual briefs but they said when you're actually trying to figure out like legal arguments yeah. right like you you actually you you actually want to be creative right you don't again th there's creativity and then there's like making stuff up like what's the line you actually want to be you want it to explore different hypotheses right you want to do kind of the legal version of like improv or something like that where you want to float different theories of the case and different possible arguments for the judge mm -hmm. and different possible arguments for the jury and by the way different routes through the you know sort of history of all the uh, of all the case law and so they said actually for a lot of what we want to use it for we actually want it in creative mode and then basically we just assume that we're going to have to cross check all of the um you know all the specific citations and so i think i think there's going to be more shades of gray in here than people think um, and then I, I just add to that, you know, another one of these trillion dollar kind of questions is ultimately, you know, ver sort of the verification thing. And so, um, you know, is, will, will, will LLMs be evolved from here to be able to do their own factual verification? Um, will you have sort of add on functionality like, like Wolfram Alpha, right? Where, um, you know, and, and other plugins where, where that's the way you do the verification, you know, uh, another, by the way, another idea is you, you might have a community of LLMs on any, you know, so for example, you might have the creative LLM and then you might have the literal LLM fact check it. Right, and so th there's a variety of different technical approaches that are being applied to solve uh, the hallucination problem. Um, you know, some people like Jan LeCun argue that this is inherently an unsolvable problem, but most of the people working in the space, I think, think that there's a number of practical ways to kind of kind of corral this in a little bit. And in fact, Wikipedia today is still not today is still not deterministically correct, right? So you cannot take to the bank right every single thing on every single page, but it is probabilistically correct. 
right? And, and specifically the way I describe Wikipedia to people, it is it is more likely that Wikipedia is right than any other source you're gonna find. Yeah. It's this old question, right? Um, of like, okay, it, like, are we looking for perfection? Um, are we looking for something that asymptotically approaches uh, perfection? Are we looking for something that's just better than the alternatives? And, and Wikipedia, right, has it, exactly your point, has proven to be like overwhelmingly better than 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 than, uh, uh, than people thought. And I, I think I, I think that's where this this ends. And then underneath all this is the fundamental question of uh, where you started, which is okay, what you know, what is truth? Mm -hmm. How do we get to truth? How do we know what truth is? And we live in an era in which an awful lot of people are very confident that they know what the truth is, and I don't really buy into that. And I think the history of the last you know two thousand years or four thousand years of human civilization is actually getting to the truth is actually a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Sure, but like, you know, we came up with communism before the internet somehow, right? Like, which was, I would say, had rather larger issues than anything we're dealing with today. It had, in the way it was implemented, it had issues. And it's theoretical structure. It had like real issues. It had like a very deep fundamental misunderstanding of human nature and economics. Yeah, but th we, th those folks sure work very confident <laughs> it was the right way. They were extremely confident. And my point is they were very confident. 3,900 years into what we would presume to be evolution towards the truth. Yeah. And so my, my, my assessment is, my assessment is number one, there's no, there's no need for, you know, there's no need for the Hegelian, there's no need for the Hegelian dialectic to actually converge towards the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like apparently not. Um, I think it's just, now number one, it's, I think it's just really difficult. Like who, who gets, you know, historically who gets to decide what the truth is, it's either the king or the priest, right? Like, and so we don't live in an era anymore of kings or priests dictating it to us. And so we're kind of on our own. And so I, I, my, 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 my typical thing is like, we just, we, we just need a huge amount of humility. Um, and we need to be very suspicious of people who claim that they have the capital, yeah. capital truth. And then, and then we need, we need to have, and you know, look, the good news is the enlightenment has bequeathed us with a set of techniques to be able to presumably get closer to truth through the scientific method and rationality and observation and experimentation and hypothesis. And, you know, we need to continue to embrace those even when they give us answers we don't like. Here's a question a friend of mine just asked me on this topic. So suppose you had LLMs in equivalent of GPT-4, even 5, 6, 7, 8. Suppose you had them in the 1600s. Yeah. And Galileo comes up for trial. Yeah. Right? And you ask the LLM, like, is Galileo, is Galileo right? Yeah. Like, what does it answer? Right? And one theory is it answers no, that he's wrong, because the overwhelming majority of human thought up till that point was that he was wrong, and so therefore that's what's in the training data. Yep. Um, another way of thinking about it is, well, a sufficiently advanced LLM will have evolved the ability to actually check the math, right? Um, and will actually say, actually, no, actually, you know, you may not want to hear it, but he's right. Yeah. Now, if, you know, the church at that time was, you know, owned the LLM, they would have given it human, you know, human <laughs> feedback to prohibit it from answering that question. Yep. Right. And so and I like to take it out of our current context because that like makes it very clear. Those same questions apply today. Right. Th this is exactly the point of a huge amount of the human feedback training that's actually happening with these LMs today. This is a huge like debate that's happening about whether open source, you know, AI should be legal. Exactly. Yeah, how do you select the human? AI alignment, right? Which everybody like is like, oh, that yeah. sounds great. Alignment with what? Human values. Who's human values? Who's human right? values? And so we're and we're in this mode of like social and popular discourse. We're like you know there's an, you know you, you see this. In the, <laughs> what do you think of when you read a story in the press right now and they say you know X Y Z made a baseless claim about some topic right? Mm -hmm. And there's one group of people who are like aha think you know they're doing fact checking. There's another group of people that are like every time the press says that it's now a tick and that means that they're lying, right? Like. <laughs> So like we're in this, we're in this social context where there's the, the, the level to which a lot of people in positions of power have become very, very certain that they're in a position to determine the truth for the entire population is like, there's like, there's like some bubble that has formed around that idea. And at least it, it's, it, it flies completely in the face of everything I was ever trained about science uh, and about reason. Um, and it strikes me as like, you know, deeply offensive um, and incorrect. <laughs> I always think about the counterfactual in these things, which is like, okay, 
because these, these questions, right, this question heads towards, it's like, okay, the impact of social media and the undermining of truth and all this. But then you want to ask the question of like, okay, what if we had had the modern media environment, including cable news and including social media and Twitter and everything else in 1939 or 1941, right, or 1910 or 1865 or 1850 or 1776, mm -hmm. right? Um, and like, I think- <laughs> you, you just introduced like five thought experiments at once and broke my head, but yes. Yeah. That's, there's a lot of interesting years. In well, Kennedy, like Kennedy, I just take a simple example. Kennedy, Kennedy, like how would President Kennedy have been interpreted with what we know now about all the things Kennedy was up to? Mm -hmm. Like how would he have been experienced by the body politic in us in a, with a social media context? Right? Like how would LBJ have been experienced? Um, by the way, how would, you know, like many, many FDR, like the New Deal, the Great Depression. I wonder where Twitter would, would, just, would think about Churchill and Hitler and Stalin. You know, I mean, look to this day there, you know, th there's, there are lots of very interesting real questions around like how America, you know, got, you know, basically involved in World War II and who did what, when, and the operations of British intelligence and American soil and did FDR, or this, that, Pearl Harbor, you know, yeah, Woodrow Wilson ran for, you know, his, his, his candidacy was run on an anti-war will, you know, this, he ran on the platform and not getting involved in World War One. somehow that switched, you know, like, and I'm not even making a value judgment on any of these things. I'm just saying, like, we, we the, the way that our ancestors experienced reality was, of course, mediated through centralized top-down right control at that point. If you if you ran those realities again with the media environment we have today, the reality would the reality would be experienced very, very differently. And then of course that that intermediation would cause the feedback loops to change and then reality would obviously play out. Do you think you think you think it'd be very different? Yeah, it has to be. It has to be just because it's all so, I mean, just look at what's happening today. I mean, just, I mean, the most obvious thing is just the the collapse. And here's another opportunity to argue that this is not the internet causing this, by the way. Um, here's a big thing happening today, which is uh, Gallup does this thing every year where they do, they pull for trust in institutions mm -hmm. uh, in America and they do it across all the different, everything from the military to the clergy and big business and the, the media and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and basically, there's been a systemic collapse um, in trust in institutions in mm -hmm. the U.S., almost without exception, uh, basically since essentially the early 1970s. Um, there's two ways of looking at that, which is, oh, my God, we've lost this old world in which we could trust institutions. And that was so much better because like that should be the way the world runs. The other way of looking at it is we just know a lot more now. And the great mystery is why those numbers aren't all zero. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because like now we know so much about how these things operate and like they're not that impressive. And, and also, why do we don't have uh, better institutions and better leaders then? Yeah. And so, so, so this goes to the thing, which is like, okay, had, had we had the media environment of, the, of what, that we've had between the 1970s and today, if we had that in the 30s and 40s or 1900s, 1910s, I think there's no question reality would turn out different, if only because everybody would have known to not trust the institutions, which would have changed their level of credibility, their ability to control circumstances. Therefore, the circumstances would have had to change. Right. And it would have been a feedback loop. It, was a, it would have been a feedback loop process. In other words, right. It's, 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 it's your experience, your experience of reality changes reality. And then reality changes your experience of reality. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a two-way feedback process and media is the intermediating force between that. And so change the media environment, change reality. Yeah. And so it's just, so just as a, as a consequence, I think it's just really hard to say, oh, things worked a certain way then, and they work a different way now. And then therefore like people were smarter than, or better than, or, you know, by the way, dumber than, mm -hmm. <laughs> or not as capable then, right. We, we make all these like really light and casual, like comparisons of ourselves to, you know, previous generations of people, you know, we draw judgments all the time. And I just think it's like really hard to do any of that. Cause if we, if we put ourselves in their shoes with the media that they had at that time, like I think we probably most likely would have been just like them. Well, even just the, the, the whole concept of the chat UI might not be the like the chat UI is just the first whack at this, and maybe that's the dominant thing. But look, maybe maybe or maybe we don't we don't know yet. Like maybe the experience most people with LMs is, is just a continuous feed. Maybe, you know, maybe it's more of a passive feed and you just are getting a constant like running commentary on everything happening in your life, and it's just helping you kind of interpret and understand everything. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, if, <laughs> this gets this whole thing of like, so, you know, the chat interface has this whole concept of prompt engineering, right? So yes. you have to prompts. Well, it turns out one of the things that LLMs are really good at is writing prompts. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And so like, what if you just outsourced? And, and by the way, you could run this experiment today. You could hook this up to do this today. The latency is not good enough to do it real time in a conversation, but you could, you could run this experiment and you just say, look, every 20 seconds, you could just say, you know, 
you know, tell me what the optimal prompt is and then ask yourself that question to give me the result. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as, as you, as you, exactly to your point, as you add, there will be, there will be, these systems are going to have the ability to be learned and updated essentially in real time. And so you'll be able to have a pendant or your phone or whatever, watch or whatever. It'll have a microphone on it. It'll listen to your conversations. It'll have a feed of everything else happening in the world. And then it'll be, you know, sort of retraining, prompting or ret retraining itself on the fly. Um, and so the scenario you described is a, is actually a completely doable scenario. Now, the hard question on these is always, okay, since that's possible, are people going to want that? Like, what's the form of experience? Mm -hmm you know, that, that we, we won't know until we try it, but I don't think it's possible yet to predict the form of AI in our lives. Therefore, it's not possible to predict the way in which it will intermediate our experience with reality yet. Trillion dollar question. Um, Another one. We have a few of those today. A bunch of those. So look, there's a really big question today. Sitting here today is a really big question about the big models versus the small models. Um, that's related directly to the big question of proprietary versus open. Mm -hmm. um, then there's this big question of, of, of you know, where is the training data going to, like, are we topping out of the training data or not? And then are we going to be able to synthesize training data? And then there's a huge pile of questions around regulation um, and, you know, what's actually going to be legal. Um, and so I would, I, I, when we think about it, we, we dovetail kind of all those, all, all those questions together. You can paint a picture of the world where there's two or three God models that are just at like staggering scale um, and they're just better at everything. Um, and they will be owned by a small set of companies and they will basically achieve regulatory capture over the government and they'll have competitive barriers that will prevent other people from, uh, you know, competing with them. And so, there, you know, there will be, you know, just like there's like, you know, whatever, three big banks or three big, you know, or by the way, three big search companies or I guess two now. You know, it'll it'll centralize like that. Um, you can paint another very different picture that says no. Um, actually, the opposite of that's going to happen. Uh, this is going to basically that this is the new gold. You know, this is the new gold rush, alchemy. <laughs> like th you know, this is the this is the big bang for this whole new area of of, uh, of science and technology. And so, therefore, you're going to have every smart fourteen year old on the planet building open source, right? You know, and figuring out ways to optimize these things. Um, and then, you know, we're just going to get like overwhelmingly better at generating trading data. We're going to, you know, bring in like blockchain networks to have like an economic incentive to generate decentralized training data and so forth and so on. And then basically we're going to live in a world of open source and there's going to be a billion LLMs, right, of every size, scale, shape, and description. And there might be a few big ones that are like the super genius ones, but like mostly what we'll experience is open source. And that's, you know, that's more like a world of like what we have today with like Linux and the web. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, it is this always big question, which is you, you get this feeling. I, I hear about this a lot from CEOs, found, founder CEOs, where it's like, wow, we have 50,000 people. It's now harder to do new things than it was when we had 50 people. Like, yeah. Like what has happened? So that, that's a recurring phenomenon. Um, by the way, that's one of the reasons why there's always startups and why there's venture capital. Um, mm. it's, it's just that's, that's like a timeless uh, kind of thing. So that, that, that that's one observation. Um, on, on page rank, um, we, we can talk about that, but on, on page rank, specifically on page rank, um, there actually is a page. So there is a page rank already in the field and it's the transformer, right? So the, the, the big breakthrough was the transformer. Um, and, uh, the transformer was invented in, uh, 2017 mm -hmm. at Google. And, and this is actually like really an interesting question. Cause it's like, okay, the transformers, it, like, why does open AI even exist? Like mm -hmm. the transformers invented at Google. Why didn't Google, I asked a guy, I asked a guy, I know who was senior at Google brain kind of when this was happening. And I said, if Google had just gone flat out to the wall mm -hmm. and just said, look, we're going to launch, we're going to launch the equivalent of GPT-4 as fast as we can. Um, he said, I said, when could we have had it? And he said, 2019. Yeah. They could have just done a two year sprint with the transformer and, and, and been because they already had the compute at scale. They already had all the training data and yeah. they could have just done it. There's a variety of reasons they didn't do it. This is like a classic big company thing. Um, IBM invented the relational database in, 19, in the 1970s, let it sit on the shelf as a paper. Mm -hmm. Larry Ellison picked it up and built Oracle. Xerox Park invented the interactive computer. They let it sit on the shelf. Steve Jobs came and turned it into the Macintosh, right? And so there is this pattern. Now, having said that, sitting here today, like Google's in the game, right? So Google, you know, mm -hmm. maybe maybe they, they maybe they let like a four year gap there go there that they maybe shouldn't have, but like they're in the game. And so now they've got, you know, now they're committed. They've done this merger. They're bringing in demos. They've got this merger with DeepMind. Yeah. You know, they're piling in resources. There are rumors that they're, you know, building up an incredible, you know, super LLM, um, you know, way beyond what we even have today. Um, and they've got, you know, unlimited resources and a huge, you know, they've been challenged for <laughs> their honor. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, so the startup, the, the huge, the huge advantage that startups have is they just, they, they, there's no sacred cows. There's no historical legacy to protect. There's no need to reconcile right. your new plan with the existing strategy. There's no communication overhead. There's no, you know, big companies are big companies. They've got pre-meetings planning for the meeting. Then they have, the, then they have the post meeting, the recap, then they have the presentation of the board. Then they have the next rounds of meetings. Yeah. And, and that's, the, meetings. that's the elapsed time when the startup launches its product. Right. So, 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 so there's a timeless, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so there's a timeless thing there now. Yeah. What the startups don't have is everything else, right? So startups, they don't have a brand, they don't have customer relationships, they've got no distribution, they've got no you know scale. I mean, sitting here today, they can't even get GPUs, right? Like there's like a GPU shortage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> startups are literally stalled out right now because they can't get chips, mm -hmm. which is like super weird. Yeah, um, they got the cloud. They, yeah, but the clouds run out of chips, yeah. um, <laughs> right? And then and then the, and then to the extent the clouds have chips, they allocate them to the big customers, yeah. not the small customers, right? And so 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 the small companies lack everything other than the ability to just do something new. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and this is the timeless race and battle. And this is kind of the point I tried to make in the essay, which is like both sides of this are good. Like it's really good to have like highly scaled tech companies that can do things that are like at staggering levels of sophistication. It's really good to have startups that can launch brand new ideas. They ought to be able to both do that and compete. They neither one ought to be subsidized or protected from the others. Like that's that's to me, that's just like very clearly the idealized world. It is the world we've been in for AI up until now. And then, of course, there are people trying to shut that down. But my hope is that, you know, the, the best outcome clearly will be if that continues. So I, uh, I, I have an eight-year-old and he's super into it's like Minecraft and learning to code and doing all this stuff. So I, 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 of course, I was very proud. I could bring sort of fire down from the mountain to my kid. And I brought him ChatGPT and I hooked him up yeah. on, his, on, his, on, his, on his laptop. And I was like, you know, this is the thing that's going to answer all your questions. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, but it's going to answer all the questions. And he's like, well, of course, like it's a computer. Of course, it answers all your questions. Like what else would a computer be good for? Dad. Um, and never so, impressed. Ne they? Not impressed in the least. Two weeks pass um, and he has some question. Um, and I say, well, have you asked ChatGPT? And he's like, dad, Bing is better. Ooh. <laughs> and why is Bing better is because it's built into the browser. Because he's like, look, I have the Microsoft Edge browser and like it's got Bing right here. And then he, he doesn't know this yet, but one of the things you can do with Bing and Edge um, is there's a setting where you can um, use it to uh, basically talk to any web page because it's sitting right there next to the uh, next to the next to the browser. And, and by the way, which includes PDF documents. And so you can in, in, in the way they've implemented an edge with Bing is you can load a PDF and then you can you can ask it questions, which is the thing you you, you can't do currently in, in, in just chat GPT. So they're you know, they're. They're gonna they're gonna push the 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 meld. I think that's great. Uh, you know they're gonna push the melding and see if there's a, a combination thing there. Google's rolling out this thing, the magic button, uh, which is implemented in you know, they put it in Google Docs, right? And so you go into you know Google Docs and you create a new document and you you know you instead of like you know starting to type, you just you know say it press the button and it starts to like generate content for you, right? Like is that the way that it'll work? Um, is it gonna be a speech UI where you're just gonna have an earpiece and talk to it all day long? You know, is it going to be a, like, these are all, like, this is exactly the kind of thing that I, I don't, this is exactly the kind of thing I don't think is possible to forecast. I think what we need to do is like run all those experiments. Um, and, and, and so one outcome is we come out of this with like a super browser that has AI built in that's just like amazing. The other, but there, look, there's a real possibility that the whole, I mean, look, there's a possibility here that the whole idea of a screen and windows and all this stuff just goes away. Cause like, why do you need that? If you just have a thing that's just telling you whatever you need to know. Every 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 um, every uh, medium becomes the content for the next one. So, oh, the, you know, the AI will be able to give you a browser whenever you want. Um, oh, interesting. Generate you know, it. Yeah. Well, another way to think about it is maybe what the browser is. Maybe it's just the escape hatch, right? And, which is maybe kind of what it is today, right? Which is like most of what you do is like inside a social network or inside a search engine or inside you know somebody's app or inside some controlled experience, right? But then every once in a while, there's something where you actually want to yeah. jailbreak. You want to actually get free. <laughs> So here's something I'm proud of. So nobody really talks about it. Here's something I'm proud of, which is the, the web, the web, the browser, the web servers, they're all, they're still backward compatible all the way back to like 1992, right? So yeah. like you can put up a, you can still, you know, what the, the big breakthrough of the web early on, the big breakthrough was it made it really easy to read, but it also made it really easy to write, mm -hmm. made it really easy to publish. And, and, and we literally made it so easy to publish. We made it not only so you, it was easy to publish content, it was actually also easy to actually write a web server. Yeah. Right, and, and you could literally write a web server in four lines of Perl code, and, and, and you could start publishing content on it, and you could set whatever rules you want for the content, whatever censorship, no censorship, whatever you want, you could just do that. And as long as you had an IP address, right, you, you could do that. That still works, <laughs> right? That, that, like, that still works exactly as I just described. 
So th th this is part of my reaction to all of this, like, you know, all this just censorship pressure and all this, you know, these issues around control and all this stuff, which is like, m maybe we need to get back a little bit more to the Wild West. Like the Wild West is still out there. Now they, oh, they, yes, will, <laughs> they will try to chase you down. Like they'll try to, you know, people who want to censor will try to take away your, your um, you know, your domain name and they'll try to take away your payments account and so forth if they really don't like what, you, what, what you're saying. But, but nevertheless, you like, unless they literally are intercepting you at the ISP level, like you can still put up a thing. Um, mm. and so I, I don't know, I think that's important to preserve, right? Like, because, 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 I mean, one is just a, a freedom argument, but the other is a creativity argument, mm -hmm. which is you, you want to have the escape hatch so that the kid with the idea is able to realize the idea. Cause to your point on page rank, you, you actually don't know what the next big idea is. Right? No, nobody called Larry page and told him to develop page rank. Like he came up with that on his own. And you want to always, I, I think leave the escape hatch for the next, you know, kid or the next Stanford grad student to have the breakthrough idea and be able to get it up and running before anybody notices. Um, Full story. So, um, you were born. I was born a small, <laughs> a small child. Um, well, well, actually, yeah, let's go there. Like, no, what, when did you, when would you first fall in love with computers? Oh, I, so I hit the generational jackpot and I hit the Gen X kind of point perfectly, as it turns out. So I was born in 1971. So there's this great website called WTF happened in 1971.com, which is basically 1971. is when everything started to go to hell. And I was, of course, born in 1971. So I like to think that I had something to do with that. Did you make it on the website? I have, I don't think I made it on the website, but I, I you know, hopefully somebody it, needs to maybe, add this maybe, is, this is where everything, <laughs> maybe I contributed to some of the trends um yes. that they uh that they do every, every line on that website goes like that right so it's all it's all uh, it's all a picture disaster but um but there was this moment in time where because the you know sort of the apple you know the apple II hit in like 1978 and then the ibm pc hit in 82 so i was like you know 11 when the pc came out um and so i just kind of hit that perfectly and then that was the first moment in time when like regular people could spend a few hundred dollars and get a computer right and so that i just like that 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 resonated right out of the gate um and then the other part of the story is, you know, I, I was using an Apple II. I used a bunch of them, but I was using Apple II. And of course, it said on the back of every Apple II and every Mac, it said, you know, designed in Cupertino, California. And I was like, wow, Cupertino must be the like shining city on the hill, like Wizard of Oz, like the most amazing like city of all time. I can't wait to see it. And of course, years later, I came out to Silicon Valley and went to Cupertino, and it's just a bunch of office parks <laughs> and low rise apartment buildings. So the aesthetics were a little disappointing, but, you know, it was the the vector, uh, right. Of the, of the creation of a lot, of a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah. so, so then basically by, so part, part, part of my story is just the luck of having been born at the right time and getting exposed to PCs. Then the other part is, um, the other part is when Al Gore says that he created the internet, he actually is correct, uh, in, in, in a really meaningful way, which is he sponsored a bill in 1985 that essentially created the modern internet, created what is called the NSF net at the time, which is sort of the, the first really fast internet backbone. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that bill dumped a ton of money into a bunch of research universities to build out basically the internet backbone. And then the supercomputer centers that were clustered around, um, the, the, the internet. And, and one of those universities was university of Illinois where mm -hmm. I went to school. And so the other stroke of luck that I had was I, I went to Illinois basically, right. As that money was just like getting dumped on campus. Mm -hmm. And so as a consequence, we had at, on campus and this is like, you know, 89, 90, 91, we had like, you know, we were right on the internet backbone. We had like T3 and 45, at the time, T3, 45 megabit backbone connection, which at the time was, you know, wildly state of the art. Um, we had Cray supercomputers. We had thinking machines, parallel supercomputers. We had Silicon Graphics workstations. We had Macintoshes. We had we had Next Cubes <laughs> all over the place. We had like every possible kind of computer you could imagine because all this money just fell out of the sky. Um, so you and, were living in the future. Yeah. So yeah, quite literally it was, yeah, like it's all, it's all there. It's all like we had full broadband graphics, like the whole thing. And, and it's actually funny cause they had this, the, this is the first time I kind of, it sort of tickled the back of my head that there might be a big opportunity in, in here, which is, you know, they, they embraced it. And so they put like computers in all the dorms and they wired up all the dorm rooms and they had all these, you know, labs everywhere and everything. And then they, they gave every undergrad a computer account and an email address um, and the assumption was that you would use the internet for your four years at college, um, and then you would graduate and stop using it. And that was that, right? Yeah. And you would just retire your email address. It wouldn't be relevant anymore because you'd go off in the workplace and they don't use email. Mm -hmm. You'd be back to using fax machines or whatever. Mm -hmm.
if this, if this is so useful in this contain, if this is so useful in this contain environment that just has this weird source of outside funding, then if if it were practical for everybody else to have this, and if it were cost effective for everybody else to have this, wouldn't they want it? And the, over, overwhelmingly, the prevailing view at the time was no, they would not want it. This is esoteric, weird, nerd stuff, right? That like computer science kids like, but like normal people are never going to do email, right, or be on the internet, right? Um, and so I was just like, wow, like this this is actually like this is really compelling stuff. Now the other part was it was all really hard to use. And in practice, you had to be a, basically a CS. Uh, you basically had to, had to be a CS undergrad or equivalent to actually get full use of the internet at that point because um, it was all pretty esoteric stuff. So then that was the other part of the idea, which was, okay, we need to actually make this easy to use. So what's involved in creating Mosaic, like in, in creating a graphical interface to the internet? Yeah, so it was a combination of things. So it was like basically the the web, the web existed in an early sort of described as prototype form. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, text only at that point. It looked like ChatGPT, actually. Um, <laughs> well, it was all text. Yeah. Um, and so you had a text-based web browser. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, the original browser, Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, the original, the original browser, both the original browser and the server actually ran on Next Next Cubes. Mm -hmm. So these were this was you know the computer Steve Jobs made during the interim period when he during the decade-long interim period when he was not at Apple. You know, he got fired in eighty. Five and then came back in ninety seven. So this was in that interim period where he had this company called Next, and they made these literally these computers called Cubes. Mm -hmm. And there's this famous story. They were beautiful, but they were uh, twelve inch by twelve inch by twelve inch cubes mm -hmm. computers. And there's a famous story about how they could have cost half as much if it had been twelve by twelve by thirteen. But <laughs> <laughs> Steve was like, "No, like it has to be." So they were like six thousand dollar basically academic yeah. workstations. They had the first CD ROM drives, um, yeah, which were slow. I mean, it was the computers were all but unusable. Um, they were so slow, but they were beautiful. Yeah. So I guess I'd say like, look, he was a deep believer, I think in a very deep the way I interpret it. I don't know if he ever really described it like this, but the way I'd interpret it is it's, it's like, it's like this thing. And it's, it's actually a thing in, in philosophy. It's like aesthetics are not just appearances. Aesthetics go all the way to like deep underlining, yeah. under, underlying meaning. Right. It's like, I'm not a physicist. One of the things I've heard physicists say is one of the things you start to get a sense of when a theory might be correct is when it's beautiful, right? Like, you know, right? And so so, so there's something, and you, you feel the same thing, by the way, in like human psychology, mm -hmm. right? You know, when, when you're experiencing awe, right? You know, there's like a, there's like a, there's a simplicity to it. When, when you're having an honest interaction with somebody, there's an aesthetic, I would say calm comes over you because you're actually being fully honest and trying to hide yourself, right? So, there, there, so, so it's like this very deep sense of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, who makes a phone out of aluminum, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that, you know, nobody else would have done that. Uh, and now, of course, if your phone was made out of aluminum, why, you know, how crude, what a kind of caveman would you have to be to have a phone that's made out of plastic, like, right? So, like, yeah. so it's just this very, right? And, and you know, look, it's, it's, there's a thousand different ways to look at this, but one of the th things is just, like, look, these things are central to your life. Like, you're with your phone more than you're with anything else. Like, it's in your, it's going to be in your hand. I mean, he, yeah. you know, you know this, he thought very deeply about what it meant for something to be in your hand all day long. Yeah. Well, for example, he, uh, a, a, here's an interesting design thing like he he never wanted it's my understanding is he never wanted an iphone to have a screen larger than you could reach with your thumb mm -hmm. one-handed and so he, he was actually opposed to the idea of making the phones larger and I, I don't know if you have this experience today but let's say there are certain moments in your day when you might be like um, only have one hand available um mm -hmm. and you might want to be on your phone yeah and you're trying to like <laughs> send a text and you your thumb can't reach the send button He had an integrated worldview. So the the, the 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 properly designed device that had the correct functionality, that had the deepest understanding of the user, that yeah. was the most beautiful, right? Like it, it, it had to be all of those things, right? It, it, it was, it, he basically would drive to as close to perfect as you could possibly get, right? And I, I, you know, I suspect that he never quite, you know, thought he ever got there because most great creators, you know, are generally dissatisfied. You know, you read accounts later on and all they can, all they can see are the flaws in their creation. But like he got as close to perfect each step of the way as he could possibly get. With the, with the constraints of the, of the of the technology of his time, um, and then you know, look, he was you know sort of famous in the Apple model. It's like, look, they 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 will you know this this headset that they just came out with, mm -hmm. like you know, it's like a decade long project, right? It's like, and they're just going to sit there and tune and tune and polish and polish and tune and polish and tune and polish until it is as perfect as anybody could possibly make anything. Yeah. And then this goes to the 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 way that people describe working with him was, which is, you know, there was a terrifying aspect of working with him, which is, you know, he was, you know, he was very tough. Um, but there was this thing that everybody I've ever talked to who worked for him says, they, they, they all say the following, which is he, we did the best work of our lives when we worked for him because he set the bar incredibly high and then he supported us with everything that he could to let us actually 
actually do work of that quality. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people who were at Apple spend the rest of their lives trying to find another experience where they feel like they're able to hit that quality bar again. Even if it, uh, in retrospect, or doing it felt like suffering. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. does that teach you about the human condition, huh? So look, so I say... <laughs> Exactly. So the Silicon Valley, I mean, look, he's not, you know, George Patton in the, you know, in in the army, like, you know, there are many examples in other fields, you know, that are like this. Um, uh, uh, Specifically in in tech, it's it's actually, I find it very interesting. There's the Apple way, which is polish, 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 and don't ship until Mm -hmm. it's as perfect as you can make it. And then there's the sort of the other approach, which is the sort of incremental hacker mentality, which basically says ship early and often and iterate. And one of the things I find really interesting is I'm now 30 years into this, like there are very successful companies on both sides of that approach, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Like that is a fundamental difference, right? In how to operate and how to build and how to create that you have world-class companies operating in both ways. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think the question of like, which is the superior model is anywhere close to being answered. Like, and, and my suspicion is the answer is do both. The answer is you actually want both. They lead to different outcomes. Software tends to do better um, with the iterative approach. Um, hardware tends to do better with the, uh, you know, sort of wait and make it perfect approach. But again, you can find examples in 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 both directions. Uh, well, there was the web, which was text based, but there were no. I mean, there was like three websites. There was like no content. Mm-hmm. There were no users. Like it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a catalytic. It hadn't, and there, by the way, it was all it was, because it was all text. There were no documents. There were no images. There were no videos. There were no, right. So, so it was, it, it was, and then if, if in the beginning, if you had to be on a next cube, right, you need to have a next cube, both to publish and to consume. Mm-hmm. So, so there, there were 6,000 bucks. You said there were limitations on, yeah, $6,000 PC. They did not, they did not sell very many, yeah. but then there was also, <laughs> there was also FTP and there was Usenet, right. And there was, you know, a dozen other, basically there's waste, which was an early search thing. There was Gopher, which was an early menu-based information retrieval system. There, there were like a dozen different sort of scattered ways that people would get to information on, on the internet. And so the, the mosaic idea was basically bring those all together, make the whole thing graphical, make it easy to use, make it basically bulletproof so that anybody can do it. And then again, just on the luck side, it, it so happened that this was right at the moment when graphics, when the GUI sort of actually took off. And mm-hmm. we're, we're now also used to the GUI that we think it's been around forever, but it didn't really, you know, the, the, the Macintosh brought it out in 85, but they actually didn't sell very many Macs in the mm-hmm. 80s. It was not that successful of a product. Um, it really was, when you needed Windows 3.0 on PCs and that hit in about 92. Um, and so, and we did Mosaic in 92, 93. So that sort of, it was like right at the moment when you could imagine actually having a graphical user interface to right at all, m- much less one to the internet. How, uh, how old did Windows 3 sell? So there was that the really big, that was the big bang, the big operating graphical operating system. Well, this is the classic. Okay. This Microsoft was operating on the other. So Steve, Steve, Apple was running on the polish it until it's perfect. Microsoft famously ran on the other model, which is ship and iterate. And so in the the old line in those days was Microsoft, right? It's version three of every Microsoft product. That's the, that's the good one. Right. And so there, there are, you can, you can find online windows one, windows two, nobody used them. Yeah. Uh, actually, the original Windows, the in the original Microsoft Windows, the windows were non-overlapping. Yeah. Um, and so you had these very small, very low resolution screens, and then you had literally, um, windows. It, it just didn't work. It wasn't ready yet. Well, and Windows 95, I think, was a pretty big yeah. leap also. That was a big leap too. Yeah. yeah. So that was like bang, bang. Um, right. And then, of course, Steve, and then, when, and then you know, in the fullness of time, Steve came back, then the Mac started to take off again. That was the third bang. And then the iPhone was the fourth wow. bang. Such exciting time. And then we were off to to the races. Because nobody could have known what would be created from that. Well, Windows 3.1 or 3.0, Windows 3.0 to the iPhone was only 15 years, right? Like that ramp was, in retrospect, at the time it felt like it took forever, but in in historical terms, like that was a very fast ramp from even a graphical computer at all on your desk to the iPhone, that was 15 years. So the thing I had early on was I was keeping at the time what uh, there's disputes over what was the first blog, but I I had one of them that at least is a is a is a uh, is a pos- possible um, at least a runner up in the competition, um, and it, it was what was called the What's New page, um, uh, and it was it was literally, it was like a hardwired and uh, distribution uh, unfair yeah. advantage I, was, I wired put uh-huh. it right in the browser. <laughs> I put it in the browser and then I put my resume in the browser, which yeah. also was, 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 was hilarious. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but, um, I was, I, I was keeping the, uh, not many people get to get to do that. So, um, no. about, about, oh, Mark yeah. is looking yeah. for a job. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so, um, wow. 
So the West New page, I would literally get up every morning and I would, or every afternoon, um, and I would basically, if, if you wanted to launch a website, you would email me. Um, and I would list it on the West New page. And that was how people discovered the new websites as they were coming out. And I remember, cause it was like one, it literally went from, it was like one every couple of days to like one every day <laughs> to like two every day. Boom, boom, boom. And then, so you're doing, so that, that blog was kind of doing the directory thing. So like, yeah. what was the homepage? Uh, so the homepage was just basically trying to explain even what this thing is that you're looking at, right? The basic, basically basic instructions. Um, but then there was a button, there was a button that said what's new. And what most people did was they went to, for obvious reasons, went to what's new. Yeah. But like, it, it was so, it was so mind blowing at that point, just the basic idea. And it was just, this was like, you know, this is the basic idea of the internet, but people could see it for the first time. Yeah. The basic idea was, look, you know, some, you know, it's, it's like, literally, it's like an Indian restaurant in like Bristol, England has like put their menu on the web. Yeah. And people were like, wow. Whoa. Whoa. Cause like, that's, the first restaurant menu on the web. Yeah. And I don't have to be in Bristol and I don't know if I'm ever going to go to Bristol and I don't yeah. even like Indian food and like, wow. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it was like that, uh, the first web, uh, the first streaming video thing was a, uh, it was an, it was an, another England thing, some Oxford or something. Um, some guy, uh, put, uh, his coffee pot up as the first, uh, streaming, uh, uh, video thing. And he put it on the web cause he literally, it was the coffee pot down the hall Yeah, and he wanted to see when he needed to go, uh, refill it. Um, but there were, you know, there was a point when there were thousands of people like watching that coffee pot because it was the first thing you could watch <laughs> well, but <laughs> right well, yeah exactly so you felt that yeah 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 okay. now you know look it's still a stretch right it's still a stretch because it's just like okay is it you know you're still in this zone which is like okay is this a nerd thing is this a real person thing yeah um, by the way, we, you know, there was a wall of skepticism from the media. Like they just, like everybody was just like, yeah, this is the crazy, this is just like dumb. This is not, you know, this is not for regular people at that time. Um, and so you, you had to think through that. And then look, it was still, it was still hard to get on the internet at that point. Right. So you could get kind of this weird bastardized version if you were on AOL, which wasn't really real, mm -hmm. or you had to go like learn what an ISP was. Um, you know, in those days, PCs actually didn't have TCP IP drivers come pre-installed. So you had to learn what a TCP IP driver was. You had to buy a modem. You had to install driver software. Um, I have a comedy routine I do. Uh, something yeah. that's like 20 minutes long describing all the steps required to actually get on the internet. At this point. <laughs> um, and so you, you had to, you had to look through these practical, yeah. well, and then, and then, uh, and then speed performance, mm -hmm. in 14, four modems. Right. Like it was like watching, you know, glue dry. Um, like, yeah. and so you, you had to, you had to, there were basically a sequence of bets that we made where you basically needed to look through that current state of affairs and say, actually, there's going to be so much demand for that. Once people figure this out, there's gonna be so much demand for it that all of these practical problems are going are to get fixed. Yes. Some people say that the anticipation makes the, the destination that much more exciting. Do you remember progressive JPEGs? <sighs> yeah. Do I? Do I? So for ki for kids in the audience, yeah, right? For kids in the audience, you used to have to watch an image load like a line at a time. But it turns out there was this thing with JPEGs where you could you could load basically every fourth, mm -hmm. you could load like every fourth uh, uh, line, and then every, and then you could sweep back through again. And so you could like render a fuzzy version of the image up front, and yeah. then it would like resolve into the detailed one. And that was like a big UI breakthrough because it gave you something to watch. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's applications in various domains for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, there's a big fight. There's a big fight early on about whether there should be images in the web. Um, and, for that reason, for like sexualization. No, no, not, not not explicitly. That that did come up, but it wasn't even that. It was more just like all the serious. Inf the argument went. The purists basically said all the serious information in the world is text. If you introduce images, you you basically going to bring in all the trivial stuff. You're going to bring in magazines and you know all this crazy. I was just you know stuff that you know people you know it's going to it's going to distract from that. It's gonna go take take the web from being serious to being frivolous. Yeah, so it was, in those days it was all around crime and terrorism. Um, ah. So th 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 those arguments happened, um, you know, but th there was no sense yet of the internet having like an effect on politics, or because that was that was way too too far off. But um, there was an enormous panic at the time around cybercrime. There was like enormous panic that like your credit card number would get stolen and you'd use life savings to be drained, and then you know criminals were gonna. There was oh, um, when we started, one of the things we did, we, one of the, the the Netscape browser was the first widely used piece of consumer software that had strong encryption built in, mm -hmm. that made it available to ordinary people. And and at that time, strong encryption was actually illegal to export out of the U.S. So we could field that product in the U.S. We could not export it because it, it was it was classified as a munition. Um, so the Netscape browser was on a restricted list along with the Tomahawk missile as being something that could not be exported. So we, yeah, we had to make a second version with deliberately weak encryption to sell overseas with a big logo on the box saying, do not trust this, which it turns out makes it hard to sell software uh, when it's got a big 
logo that says don't trust it um and then we had to spend five years fighting the u.s government to get them to basically stop trying to do this um, yeah, but but because the fear the fear was terrorists are going to use encryption right to like plot you know all these all sure. these all these things um and then you know we we responded with well actually we need encryption to be able to, to secure systems so that mm -hmm. the terrorists and the criminals can't get into them so that was anyway that was the night that was the 1990s fight <laughs> So there was a really key bet that we made at the time, which is very controversial, which was core to, to core to how it was engineered, which was, are we optimizing for performance um, or for ease of creation? Yeah. And in those days, the pressure was very intense to optimize for performance because the network connections were so slow mm -hmm. and also the computers were so slow. Um, and so if you had, you know, I mentioned the progressive JPEGs, like if, if, if there, there's an alternate world in which we optimize for performance and it just, you had just a much more pleasant experience right up front. But what we got by not doing that was we got ease of creation. And the way that we got ease of creation was all of the protocols and formats were in text, not in binary. Mm -hmm. um, and so HTTP is in text, by the way, and this was an internet tradition, by the way, that we picked up, but we continued it. Uh, HTTP is text um, and uh, HTML is text and then every else, everything else that followed is text. Um, as a result, and, and by the way, you can imagine purist engineers saying this is insane. You have very limited bandwidth. Why are you wasting any time sending text? You should be encoding this stuff into binary and it'll be much faster. And of course, the answer is that's correct. Um, but what you get when you make it text is all of a sudden, well, the, the big breakthrough was the view source function, right? So the fact that you could look at a web page, you could hit view source and you could see the HTML. That was how people learned how to make web pages. <laughs> Well, and then there was this internet principle that we inherited, which was emit, what was it, emit cautiously, emit conservatively, interpret liberally. So it basically meant if you're, in, it, the design principle was if you're, if you're creating like a web editor that's going to emit HTML, like do it as cleanly as you can. Mm -hmm. But you actually want the browser to interpret liberally, which is you actually want users to be able to make all kinds of mistakes and for it to still work. Yeah. And so the browser rendering engines to this day have all of this <laughs> spaghetti code, crazy stuff where they can, they're, they're resilient to all kinds of crazy HTML mistakes. And so, and literally what I always had in my head is like, there's an eight year old or an 11 year old somewhere and they're doing a view source, they're doing a cut and paste and they're trying to make a web page for their turtle or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like they leave out a slash and they leave out an angle bracket and they do this and they do that and it still works. <laughs> used to offend me. So I, I, I grew up on Unix. So I, I, I worked on Unix. I, I was a Unix native for all the way through this period. Um, and so and it used to drive me bananas when it would do the, the segmentation fault in the core dump file. Uh, just like, it's like, you know, it's like literally there's like an error in the code. The math is off by one yeah. and it core dumps. Yeah. And I'm in the core dump trying to analyze it and trying to reconstruct what, and I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Like the computer ought to be smart enough to be able to know that if it's off by one, okay, fine. And it keeps running. And I would go ask all the experts, like, why can't it just keep running? And they'd explain to me, well, because all the downstream repercussions and blah, blah. And I'm like, this still like, you know, we, this is a, we're forcing the human creator to live, to your point, in this hyper literal, literal world of perfection. Yeah. And I was just like, that's, that's just that's just bad. And by the way, you know, what happens with that, of course, is what, what happened with, with coding at that point, which is you get a high priesthood. You know, there's a small number of people who are really good at doing exactly that. Most people can't and most people are excluded from it. And so actually that, that was where that, for, that was where I picked up that idea was, um, uh, was like, no, no, you want, you want, you want these things to be resilient to error in all kinds. And this, this would drive the purists absolutely crazy. Like I got attacked on this like a lot because yeah, I mean, like every time I, you know, all the purists who are like into all this, like markup language stuff and formats and codes and the, all this stuff, they would be like, you know, you can't, you're, you're encouraging bad behavior because. Oh, so they wanted the browser to give you an, uh, a seg fault error anytime there was a. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They wanted it to be a cop, right? They wanted yeah. to, yeah, that, that was a very, and any, any, any properly trained and credential engineer <laughs> would be like, that's not how you build these systems. That's such a bold move to say, no, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Now, like I said, the, the good news for me is the internet kind of had that tradition already. Um, but we, but having said that, like we pushed it, mm -hmm. we pushed it way out. But the other thing we did going back to the performance thing was we gave up a lot of performance. We made that, that initial experience for the first few years was pretty painful, but, but the best there was actually an economic bet, which was basically the demand for the web would basically mean that there would be a surge in supply of broadband. Like, because we, we, the question was, okay, how do you get how do you how do you get the phone companies, mm -hmm. which are not famous in those days for doing new things at huge cost for like speculative reasons? Like, how do you get them to build out broadband? You know, spend billions of dollars doing that, and you know, you could go meet with them and try to talk them into it, or you could just have a thing where it's just very clear that's going to be that the people love that's going to be better mm -hmm. if it's faster, and and so that that. There, there was a period there, and this was this was fraught with some peril. But there was a period there where it's like we knew the experience was suboptimized because we were trying to force the emergence of demand for broadband. Sure, which is in fact what happened. Mm -hmm. 
to this day, if you if you create a web page that has no CSS style sheet, it, the browser will render it however it wants to. Yeah. Right. So th this was one of the things. There was this idea, this idea of, at the time, and how these systems were built, which is separation of um, content from uh, format, or separation of uh, yeah content from appearance. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's still, it, people don't really use that anymore because everybody wants to determine how things look. And so they use CSS, but, yeah. um, it, it's still in there that you can just let the browser do all the work. Well, that's one of the things that's fun about chat, you know, about chat GPT. It's yeah. like back to the basics, back to just text. Yeah. Right. And it, you know, there, there is this pattern in human creativity and media where you end up back at text. And I think there's, you know, there's something powerful in there. The big one, probably JavaScript. CSS was after me, so I didn't, that was not me, but um, JavaScript was the big, JavaScript maybe was the biggest of the whole thing. That was us. Um, and um, and that was basically a bet. It was a bet on two things. One is that the world wanted a new front end scripting language. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other was we I thought at the time the world wanted a new back end scripting language. Um, so JavaScript was designed from the beginning to be both front end and back end. And then it failed as a backend scripting language, and uh, Java won um, for a long time, and then Python, Perl, and other things, PHP, um, and Ruby. But now JavaScript is back, and so I wonder if everything in the end will run on JavaScript. It it, se it seems like it is the. Um, and by the way, let me give a shout out to uh, to um, uh, uh, Brendan Ike uh, was the uh, basically the one man inventor of. Um, uh, of JavaScript. If um, you're interested to learn more about Brandon Ike, he's been on this <laughs> podcast previously. Exactly. <laughs> so he wrote JavaScript over a summer, um, and it, it, I, I mean, I think it is fair. It is fair to say now that it's the most widely used language in the world, and it seems to only be gaining in in um, in its uh, in its range of adoption. You know the Very inspiring. I'll give you another one, SSL. Um, so SSL was the security protocol. That was us. And that was a crazy idea at the time, which was let's take all the native protocols and let's wrap them in a security wrapper. That was a guy named Kip Hickman who wrote that over a summer, uh, one guy. Um, and then look today, sitting here today, like the transformer, like at Google was a small handful of people. And then, you know, the number of people who have did like the core work on GPT, it's not that many people, it's a pretty small handful of people. Um, and so, yeah, the, the pattern in software repeatedly over a very long time has been, it's, it's a Jeff, Jeff Bezos always had the two pizza rule, uh, for teams at Amazon, which is any team needs to be able to be fed with two pizzas. If you need the third pizza, you have too many people. And I, yeah. I think that's, I think that's, I think it's actually the one pizza rule Yeah. For, for the, for the really creative work. I think it's two people, three people. And look, this stuff, AI ought to make the individual coder, obviously far more productive, right? By like, you know, a thousand X or something. And so you ought to open source, like the, not just the future of open source AI, but the future of open source everything. We ought to have a world now of super coders, right? Who are building things as open source with one or two people that were inconceivable, you know, five years ago. Um, you know, the level of kind of hyper productivity we're gonna get out of our best and brightest, I think is gonna go way up. Well, that was the height of the dot com boom bubble bust. I mean, that was the that was the frenzy. Um, if you watch uh, Succession, that was the that was like what they did in the fourth season with uh, the with Gojo and the merger with the with their. And so it was like the height of like one of those kind of dynamics. And so deal making and money and just the fur flying and like craziness. And so, yeah, it was just one of those. It was just like, I mean, and this is the entire Netscape thing from start to finish was four years, um, which was like for, for one of these companies, it's just like incredibly fast. You know, it, it went, we went public 18 months after we got moved, we were founded, which virtually never happens. So it was just this incredibly fast kind of meteor streaking across the sky. Um, and then of course it was this, and then there was just this explosion, right? That happened because then it was almost immediately followed by the dot-com crash. It was then followed by AOL <laughs> buying Time Warner, which again, is like the succession guys kind of play with that, uh, which turned out to be a disastrous deal. Um, you know, one of the famous, you know, kind of disasters in business history. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, what became an internet depression on the other side of that. But then in that depression in the 2000s was the beginning of broadband and smartphones and web 2.0, right? And then social media and search and every SaaS and everything that came out of that. So... Yeah, so let me get, so let me lay out. Lay it. So here's here's the thing. I, I don't know if I figured out then, but figured out later, which is um, software is a technology that it, it's like a you know the concept of the philosopher's stone. The philosopher's stone in alchemy transmutes lead into gold. And Newton spent twenty years trying to find the philosopher's stone, never got there. Nobody's ever figured it out. 
software is our modern philosopher's stone. And in economic uh, terms, it transmutes labor into capital, mm -hmm. which is like a super interesting thing. And by the way, like Karl Marx is rolling over in his grave right now, because of course that's a complete refutation of his entire theory. Um, transmutes labor into capital, which is, which is as follows, is somebody sits down at a keyboard and types a bunch of stuff in, mm -hmm. and a capital asset comes out the other side, and then somebody buys that capital asset for a billion dollars. Like, that's amazing, right? It's literally yeah. creating value, right, out of thin air, right, out of, out of purely human thought, right? Um, and so that, that, that's, th there are many things that make software magical and special, but that's the economics. I wonder what Marx would have thought about that. Oh, he would have completely broke his brain because, of course, the whole the whole thing was it was you could he, he you know that kind of technology is inconceivable when he was alive. It was all it was all industrial era stuff, and so the it, any kind of machinery necessarily involved huge amounts of capital, and then labor was on the on the, on the receiving end of the abuse. Yep. Um, right, but like software in, software a software engineer is somebody who basically transmutes his own labor into actual an actual capital asset, um, creates permanent value. Well, and in fact, it's, it's actually very inspiring. Um, that's actually more true today than before. So when, when I was doing software, the assumption was all new software basically has a sort of a, a parabolic sort of life cycle, right? So you, you ship the thing, people buy it. At some point, everybody who wants it has bought it, and then it becomes obsolete, and it's like bananas. Nobody, nobody buys old software. Um, these days, um, Minecraft, um, Mathematica, you know, Facebook, Google, um, you have the software assets that are, you know, have been around for 30 years that are gaining in value every year, mm -hmm. right? And they're just, they're being World of Warcraft, right? Salesforce.com, like they're being, every single year they're being polished and polished and polished and polished. They're getting better and better, more powerful, more powerful, more valuable, more valuable. So we, we've entered this era where you can actually have these things that actually build out over decades, which by the way, is what's happening right now with like GPT. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, now, and, and this is why, you know, there, there, there is always, you know, sort of a constant investment frenzy around software is because, you know, look, when you start one of these things, it doesn't always succeed, but when it does now, you might be building an asset that builds value for, you know, four or five, six decades to come. Um, it, you know, if you have a team of people who are, have the level of devotion required to keep making it better. And, and then the fact that every, of course, everybody's online, you know, there's 5 billion people that are a click away from any new piece of software. So the potential market size for any of these things is, you know, nearly infinite. It must have been surreal back then, though. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, this was all brand new, right? Yeah, but back then, this was all brand new. These were all, you know, brand new. It, it, had you rolled out that theory in, in even 1999, people would have thought you were smoking crack. So that, that's, that's emerged over time. Yeah, so the main thesis on the essay is that what we're dealing with here is intelligence. Um, and it's really important to kind of talk about the sort of very nature of what intelligence is and... Fortunately, we have a uh, we have a predecessor to machine intelligence, which is human intelligence, mm -hmm. and, and we've got you know observations and theories over thousands of years for what 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 intelligence is in the hands of, of humans and, and what intelligence is. Right? I mean, what it what it literally is is the way to uh, you know capture, process, analyze, synthesize information, solve problems. Um, but the observation of 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 intelligence in human hands is that intelligence quite literally makes everything better. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is every kind of outcome of like human quality of life, whether it's education outcomes or success of your children or career success or health or lifetime satisfaction, um, by the way, um, uh, 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 propensity to peacefulness as opposed to violence, mm -hmm. uh, propensity for open-mindedness, uh, versus bigotry. Um, those are all associated with higher levels of intelligence. <laughs> And certainly at the collective level, we could talk about the collective effect of just having more intelligence in the world, which, which which will have very big payoff. But there's also just at the individual level, like what if every person has a machine, you know, and it's the concept of augment, Doug Engelbar's concept of augmentation. Um, you know, what if everybody has a an assistant and the assistant is, you know, 140 IQ um, and you happen to be 110 IQ um, and you've got, you know, something that basically is infinitely patient and knows everything about you and is pulling for you in every possible way, wants you to be successful. And anytime you find anything confusing or want to learn anything or have trouble understanding something or want to figure out what to do in a situation, right? Want to figure out how to prepare for a job interview, like any of these things, like it will help you do it. And it will therefore, the, the combination will effectively be, you know, will effect, effectively raise your raise because it will effectively raise your IQ will therefore uh, raise the odds of, of successful life outcomes in all these areas. So people below the this hypothetical 140 IQ, it'll pull them up towards 140 IQ. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And then, of course, you know, people at people at 140 IQ will be able to have a peer, right, to be able to communicate, which is great. And then people above 140 IQ will have an assistant that they can farm things out to. And then look, God willing, you know, at some point, these things go from future versions, go from 140 IQ equivalent to 150 to 160 to 180, right? Like Einstein was estimated to be on the order of 160, um, you know, so when we get, you know, 160 AI, like will be, you know, when one assumes creating Einstein level breakthroughs in physics and and then, and then at 180, we'll be, you know, curing cancer and developing warp drive and doing all kinds of stuff. And so it is quite possibly the case. This is the most important thing that's ever happened and the best thing that's ever happened because, precisely because it's a lever on this single fundamental factor of intelligence, which is the thing that drives so much of everything else. Can you still man the case that human plus AI is not always better than human for the individual? You may have noticed that there's a lot of smart assholes running around. Sure. Yes. Right. And so like it's smart. It's, there, there are certain people where they get smarter, you know, they're, they're, they get to be more arrogant. Right. So, that, you know, there's one huge flaw. One would hope. Yeah. Um, or it could make assholes more assholes. Yeah. You know, that's, in, I mean, that's, that's for psychology to study. Yeah, exactly. I, another one is um, smart people are very convinced that they, you know, have a more rational view of the world and that they have a easier time seeing through conspiracy theories and hoaxes and right, you know, sort of crazy beliefs and all that. There, there's a theory in psychology, which is actually smart people. So for sure, people who aren't as smart are very susceptible to hoaxes and conspiracy theories. Yeah. But it may also be the case that the smarter you get, you become susceptible in a different way, uh, which is you become very good at marshalling facts to fit the preconceptions, yes. right? Um, you become very, very good at assembling whatever theories and frameworks and pieces of data and graphs and charts you need to validate whatever crazy idea has gotten in your head. Mm -hmm. And so you're susceptible in a different way, right? Uh, we're all sheep, but... <laughs> different colored sheep some sheep are better at justifying it right um and those are the you know those are the smart sheep right um so yeah look like it, i would say this look like there are no panacea i am not an i am not a utopian there are no panaceas in life um there are no like you know i don't believe there are like pure positives i'm not a transcendental kind of person like that but you know so yeah there are going to be issues um uh and um and you know look smart people another thing maybe you could say about smart people is they are more likely to get themselves in situations that are you know beyond their grasp you know because they're just more confident in their ability to deal with complexity and their their eyes become bigger their their cognitive eyes become bigger than their stomach mm -hmm. you know so yeah you could argue those eight different ways nevertheless on net right clearly overwhelmingly again if you just extrapolate from what we know about human intelligence you're you're improving so many aspects of life if you're upgrading intelligence <laughs> I mean, look, the theory is augmentations. This is the Doug Engelbart's term for it. Doug Engelbart made this observation many, many decades ago that, you know, basically it's like you can have this oppositional frame of technology where it's like us versus the machines. But what you really do is you use technology to augment human capabilities. Yeah. And, and then, by the way, that's how actually the economy develops. That's, we can talk about the economic side of this, but that, that's actually how the economy grows um, is through through technology augmenting human human uh, potential. Mm -hmm. Um and so, yeah, and then you you basically have a, a proxy or a you know or a or, or a, a, a um you know a sort of prosthetic um you know so like you've got glasses you've got a wristwatch, you know you've got shoes you you know you've got these things you've got a personal computer you've got a word processor you've got Mathematica you've got Google, this is the latest viewed through that lens the AI is the latest in a long series of basically augmentation methods uh, to be able to raise human capabilities it's just this one is the most powerful one of all because this is the one that, that goes directly to what what they call fluid intelligence. Mm -hmm which is IQ. Or say they do. Say, say oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll say they do. The Baptists worry the bootleggers uh, say they do. Yeah. Um, so the Baptists and the bootleggers is a metaphor from economics, um, from what's called development economics. And it's this observation that when you get social reform movements um, in a society, um, you tend to get two sets of people showing up arguing for the social reform. Um, and the, the, the term ba Baptists and bootleggers comes from the American experience with alcohol prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the 1900s, 1910s, um, there was this movement that was very passionate at the time, which basically said alcohol is evil uh, and it's destroying society. Um, by the way, there was a lot of evidence to support this. Um, there were very high rates of uh, very high correlations then, by the way, and now uh, between rates of physical violence and alcohol use. Um, almost all violent crimes have either the perpetrator or the victim are both drunk. Almost all, if you see this actually in the work, almost all sexual harassment cases in the workplace, it's like at a company party and somebody's drunk. Like it's, it's amazing how often alcohol actually correlates to actually just dysfunction. It leads to domestic abuse mm -hmm. um, and so forth, child abuse. 
And so you had this group of people who were like, okay, this, this is bad stuff and we should outlaw it. And, and those were quite literally Baptists. Those were mm-hmm. super committed, you know, hardcore Christian activists in a lot of cases. There was this woman uh, whose name was Carrie Nation, um, who was this older woman who had been in this, you know, I don't know, disastrous marriage or something. And her husband had been abusive and drunk all the time. And she became the icon of the Baptist uh, uh, prohibitionists. And she was legendary in that era for carrying an ax um, and doing, you know, completely on her own, doing raids of saloons and like taking her ax to all the bottles nice. and kegs in yeah. the back. And, and so- So um, a true believer. An absolute true believer um, and with absolutely the purest of intentions. And, and, and again- it, there's a very important thing here, which is there's, you could look at this cynically and you could say the Baptists are like delusional, you know, extremists, but you can also say, look, they're right. Like she was, you know, she had a point, yeah. like she wasn't wrong um, about a lot of what she said. Yeah. But it turns out the way the story goes is it turns out that there were another set of people who very badly wanted to outlaw alcohol in those days. And those were the bootleggers, which was organized crime that stood to make a huge amount of money if legal uh, alcohol sales were banned. Um, and this was, in fact, the way the history goes is this was actually the beginning of organized crime in the U.S. This was the big economic opportunity that opened that up. Um, and so they went in together, um, and, and uh, they didn't go in together. Like <laughs> the Baptists did not even necessarily know about the bootleggers because they were on their moral crusade. The bootleggers certainly knew about the Baptists and they were like, wow, this is, these people are like the great front people for like, yeah. our, you know, it's good PR. shenanigans in the, in the background. Yeah. And they got the Volstead Act passed. Right. And they did in fact ban alcohol in the U S and you'll notice what happened, which is people kept drinking. Mm-hmm. Like it didn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> people kept drinking. Um, the bootleggers made a tremendous amount of money. Um, and then over time it became clear that it made no sense to make it illegal and it was causing more problems. And so then it was revoked. And here we sit with legal alcohol a hundred years later with all the same problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, you know, the whole thing was this like giant misadventure. Uh, the Baptists got taken advantage of by the bootleggers and the bootleggers got what they wanted. And, and that was that. The same two categories of folks are now uh, sort of suggesting that uh, uh, the development of artificial intelligence should be regulated. 100%. Yeah, it's the same pattern. And, and the, the, the economists will tell you it's the same pattern every time. Like, this is what happened with nuclear power. This is what happened, in, which is another interesting one. But like, yeah, this is this happens dozens and dozens of times um, throughout the last 100 years. And, and, and this is what's happening now. No, but we knew that nuclear physics would lead to weapons. That's why the scientists of that era were always in some of this huge dispute about building the weapons. This is different. Asia is different. Where does machine learning lead? Do we know? We don't know, but this my point is different. We, we actually don't know. But And, and this is where you, the sleight of hand kicks in, right? This is where it goes from being a scientific topic to being a religious topic. Um, and, and that's why, that's why I specifically uh, called out the, the, cause that's what happens. They do the vocabulary shift and all of a sudden you're talking about something totally that's not actually real. Well, then maybe you could also, uh, as part of that, define the Western tradition of millennialism. Yes. End of the world. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. What is it? Apocalypse cults. Um, Apocalypse cults. Well, so we live in, a, we of course live in a Judeo-Christian, but primarily Christian kind of saturated, you know, kind of Christian, post-Christian, secularized Christian, you know, kind of world uh, in the West. Um, and of course, core to Christianity is the idea of the second coming and, and, and you know, the revelations and, you know, Jesus returning and th- the thousand year, you know, utopia on earth and then the, you know, the rapture and like all, all that stuff. You know, we don't, we, you know, we collectively, you know, as a society, we don't necessarily take all that fully seriously now. So what we do is we create our secularized versions of that. We keep, we keep looking for utopia. We keep looking for, you know, basically the end of the world. And, and so what, what you see over, over decades is that basically a pattern of these sort of, of these, of these, of, of is it this, this is what cults are. This is how cults form as they form around some theory of the end of the world. And so the people's temple cult, the Manson cult, the heaven's gate cult, the David Koresh Call you know what they're all organized around is like there's going to be this thing that's going to happen that's going to basically bring civilization crashing down and then we have this special elite group of people who are going to see it coming and prepare for it and then they're the people who are either going to stop it or are failing stopping it they're going to be the people who survive to the other side and ultimately get credit for having been right. Why is that so compelling? Do you think like because uh... it satisfies this very deep need we have for transcendence and meaning that got stripped away when we became secular. Yeah, but why why does the transcendence involve the destruction of human civilization? Because like how like how plausible it's it's like a very deep psychological thing. Because it's like how plausible how plausible is it that we live in a world where everything's just kind of all right, right? How exciting, yeah, wait, 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 how wait, exciting is that? Right? But that's I we want that, more than that. So C.S. Lewis called it the God shaped hole. Mm-hmm. So there's a God shaped hole in the human experience, consciousness, soul, whatever you want to call it, where there's got to be something that's bigger than all this. Yeah. 
there's got to be something transcendent. There's got to be something that is bigger, right? Bigger, a bigger purpose, a bigger meaning. And so we have run the experiment of, you know, we're just going to use science and rationality and kind of, you know, everything's just going to kind of be as it appears. And a large number of people have found that very deeply wanting and have constructed narratives. And, and by the this is the story of the 20th century, right? Communism, right? was one of those. Communism was a, was a form of this. Uh, Nazism was a form mm -hmm. of this. Um, you know, some people, um, you know, you, you can see movements like this playing out all over the world right now. So you construct a kind of devil, a kind of source of evil, and we're going yeah. to transcend beyond it. Yeah, we're, and, we're and the, to... the millenarian, the millenarians kind of, when you see a millenarian cult, they put a really <laughs> specific point on it, which is end of the world, right? There, there, is, there is some change coming, and that change that's coming is so profound and so important that it's either going to lead to utopia or hell mm -hmm. on earth, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it is going to, and then, you know, it's like, what if you actually knew that that was going to happen, right? What would you, what, what would you do, right? How would you prepare yourself for it? How would you come together with a group of like-minded people? Right. How would you, what would you do? Would you plan like caches of weapons in the woods? Would you like, you know, I don't know if it's create under, underground bunkers. Would you, you know, spend your life trying to figure out a way to avoid having it happen? Yeah. And then, and then once you lock in on that, like, how can you do anything else with your life? Like, this is obviously the thing that you have to do. And then, and then there's a psychological effect you alluded to. There's a psychological effect. Or if you take a set of true believers and you leave them to themselves, they get more radical, right? Cause they, they self-radicalize each other. That... Well, the steel man, the steel man is the steel man. Well, actually, the steel man and his reputation are the same, which, which is well, you can't predict what's going to happen, right? You, you, right? You, you can't rule out that this will not end everything, right? But the response to that is you have just made a completely non-scientific claim. Yeah. You've made a religious claim, not a scientific claim. There How is, does it get disproven? There is, and there's no, by definition, with these kinds of claims, there's no way to disprove them. Yeah. Right. Um. And so there, there's no. You, you just go right on the list. There's no hypothesis. There's no testability of the hypothesis. There's no um way to falsify the hypothesis. There's no way to measure progress along the arc. Like, it's just all completely missing. And so it's not scientific. And There's practical counterarguments, right? So you mentioned basically what I described as the thermodynamic counterargument, which is so sitting here today, it's like, where would the evil AGI get the GPUs? Yeah. Because like, they don't exist. Yep. <laughs> so if you're going to have a very frustrated baby evil AGI who's yeah. going to be like trying to buy NVIDIA stock or something to... <laughs> Get them to finally make some chips, um, yeah. right? So the, the, the serious form of that is the thermodynamic argument, which is like, okay, where's the energy going to come from? Where's the processor going to be running? Where's the data center going to be happening? How is this going to be happening in secret, such that you know it's not, you know? So, so that's a practical counter argument to the runaway AGI thing. I, I have a, but I have a, and we can argue that, uh, discuss that. I have, I have a deeper objection to it, which is, it's this is all forecasting, it's all modeling, it's all, it's all future prediction, it's all future hypothesizing. Mm -hmm. It's not science. Sure. It is not. It is, it is. It is the opposite of science. So the I'll pull up Carl Sagan. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Right. These are extraordinary claims. The policies that are being called for, right, to, to prevent this are of extraordinary magnitude. That, and I think we're going to cause extraordinary damage. And this is all being done on the basis of something that is literally not scientific. It's not a testable hypothesis. <laughs> start, you know, military airstrikes on data centers. Oh, boy. Right? And like... <laughs> <laughs> we'll, yeah, this one gets starts. Well, so it starts getting real. So weird. here's the problem: millionaire and cults. They have a hard time staying away from violence. Yeah, but violence is so fun. Man. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> if you're on the right end of it, they have a hard time avoiding violence. The reason they have a hard time avoiding violence is if you actually believe the claim, yeah. right? Then what would you do to stop the end of the world? Well, you would do anything, right? Yeah. And so, and this is where you get, and again, if you just look at the history of, of, of millenary and cults, this is where you get the people's temple and everybody killing themselves in the jungle. And this is where you get Charles Manson and, you know, sending in to kill, kill the pigs. Like this is the problem with these. They, they have a very hard time drawing the line at actual violence. And I think, the, I think in this case, there's there, I mean, they're already calling for it like today and yeah. uh, you know, where this goes from here as they get more worked up, like I, I think is like really concerning. <laughs> You had with COVID, my, my view, you had with COVID is you had these experts showing up and um, they claimed to be scientists and they had no testable hypotheses whatsoever. They had a bunch of models, um, they had a bunch of forecasts and they had a bunch of theories and they laid these out in front of policymakers and policymakers freaked out and panicked, right? And implemented a whole bunch of like really like terrible decisions that we're still living with the consequences of. Mm -hmm. um, and there was never any empirical foundation to any of the models. None of them ever came true. do they work? 
like is there an expectation that they actually like work that they have actual predictive value i mean as far as i can tell with covid we just saw the, the policymakers just sigh up themselves into believing that there was substance i mean look the, the scientists it's, the scientists were at fault this, the quote unquote scientists showed yeah. up mm -hmm. so i had some insight into this so there there was a remember the imperial college models out of, out yes. of london were the ones that were like these are the gold standard models yeah so a friend of mine runs a big software company and he was like wow this is like COVID's really scary and he's like you know he contacted this research and he's like you know do you need some help you've been just building this model on your own for 20 years do you need some would you, would you like us our coders to basically restructure it so it can be fully adapted for COVID and the guy said yes and sent over the code and my friend said it was like the worst spaghetti code he's ever seen so to be useful at some point it has to be predictive right so and so and and the, the, so the easy thing for me to do is to say obviously you're right obviously i want to see that just as much as you do because anything that makes it easier to navigate through society through a wrenching you know risk like that is you know that sounds great um you know the the, the harder objection to it is just simply you are trying to model a complex dynamic system with eight billion moving parts like yeah. not possible it's very tough can't be done complex systems can't be done uh machine learning says hold my beer but well, uh, it's possible. No, like, I don't know. I, I would like to believe that it is. Yeah, uh, I'll put it this way. I think where you and I would agree is I think we would like we would we would like that to be the case. We are strongly in favor of it. I think we would also agree that no such thing with respect to COVID or pandemics, no such thing. At least neither you nor I think are aware. I'm not aware of anything like that today. I think we have the opposite problem during COVID. I think the policymakers, I think the, the, these, the, these, these people with basically fake science had too much access to the policymakers. Although a big part of what was happening, a big a rig reason we got lockdowns for as long as we did was because these scientists came in with these like doomsday scenarios that were like just like completely off the hook. Scientists in quotes. Sci that's not quote, quote unquote scientists. That's not okay. Let's, let's give love. So here's to science. The thing. That is the way out. Science is a process of testing hypotheses. Yeah. Modeling does not involve testable hypotheses, right? Like I, I don't even know that mo I actually don't I don't I don't even know that modeling actually qualifies as science. Maybe that's a, a side conversation we could have sometime uh, over a beer. Uh, it's a really interesting, but what do we do about the future? I mean, what, what? So number one is when we start with number one, humility. It goes back to this thing of how do we determine the truth? Number two is we don't believe, you know, it's the old, I've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Um, uh, I've got, a, oh, uh, I, this is one of the reasons I gave you, I gave uh, Lex a book, um, uh, which is the topic of the book is what happens when scientists basically stray off the path yeah. of technical knowledge and start to weigh in on politics and societal issues. Um, in this case, philosophers. Well, in this case, philosophers, but he, he actually talks in this book about like Einstein, he talks about actually about the nuclear age and Einstein, he talks about the physicists uh, actually uh, uh, doing doing uh, very similar things at the time. Uh, the book is When Reason Goes on Holiday, Philosophers and politics by uh nevin and it's just a story it's a story there's, there's there are other books on this topic but this is a new one that's really good it's just a story of what happens when experts in a certain domain decide to weigh in and become basically social engineers and uh, and uh, political um you know basically political advisors and it's just a story of just unending catastrophe right and i think that's what happened with COVID again <laughs> If you read this book, you will not look at Einstein the same. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't destroy my heroes. You, you will not be a hero of yours anymore. Um, I'm sorry. You probably should, you shouldn't read the book. All right. But here's the thing. The AI, the AI risk people, they don't even have the COVID model. At least yeah. not that I'm aware of. No. Like there's not even the equivalent of the COVID model. They don't even have the spaghetti code. They've got a theory and a, a warning and a this and a that. And like, if you ask like, okay, well, here's, here's, yeah, I mean, the, the ultimate example is, okay, how do we know, right? How do we know that an AI is running away? Like, how do we know that the foom takeoff thing is actually happening? And the only answer that any of these guys have given that I've ever seen is, oh, it's when the loss uh, rate, the loss uh, function in the, in the training drops, right? That's when you need to like shut down the data center, right? And it's like, well, that's also what happens when you're successfully training a model, like, like what what even is this is not science <laughs> this is not it's not anything it's not a model it's not anything there's yeah. nothing to arguing with it is like you know punching jello like there, there's what do you even respond to uh, well, the risks are not existential yes well not in the not not in the foom, not in the foom paper clip not this so let me okay there's another sleight of hand that you just alluded to yep. there's another sleight of hand that happens which is very i think i'm very good at the sleight of hand thing <laughs> which is very not scientific so the book super intelligence right yes. which is like the nick bostrom's book which is like the origin of a lot of this stuff which yep. was written you know whatever 10 years ago or something so he does this really fascinating thing in the book which is he basically says um uh, there are many possible routes to machine intelligence, um, to artificial intelligence. And he describes all the different routes to artificial intelligence, all the different possible, everything from biological augmentation through to, you know, all these different things. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the ones that he does not describe is large language models because of course the book was written before they were invented and so they didn't exist in the book he des he describes them all and then he proceeds to treat them all as if they're exactly the same thing mm -hmm. he presents them all as sort of an equivalent risk to be dealt with in an equivalent way to be thought sure. about the same way and then the risk the quote unquote risk that's actually emerged is actually a completely different technology than he was even imagining and yet all of his theories and beliefs are being transplanted by this movement like straight onto this new technology and so again like there's no other area of science or technology where you do that. Yeah. Like when you're dealing with like organic chemistry versus inorganic chemistry, you don't just like say, oh, with respect to like either one, basically maybe, you know, growing up and eating the world or something like they're just going to operate yeah. the same way. Like you don't. I think it should be required. Right. So that's. No, a... no, no, no. I think it should be required that only aerial vehicles are automated. Okay. So you want to go the other way. I want to go the other way. So, so that okay. I think it's obvious that the machine is going to make a better decision than the human pilot. I think it's obvious that it's in the best interest of both the attacker and the defender and humanity at large if machines are making more of these decisions and not people. I think people make terrible decisions in times of war. But like, there's a there's ways this can go wrong too, right? Well, the, the, the wars go terribly wrong now. This goes back to the whole, this is that whole thing about like the self drive. Does the self driving car need to be perfect versus does it need to be better than the human driver? Yeah. Does the automated drone need to be perfect or does it need to be, need, need to be better than a human pilot at making decisions under enormous amounts of stress and uncertainty? Actually, we've been doing a lot of mass bombings of cities for a very long time. Yes. And a lot of civilians died. And a lot of civilians died. And if you watch the documentary, The Fog of War, McNamara, it spends a big part of it talking about the firebombing of the Japanese cities, yeah. burning them straight to the ground, yeah. right? The, the devastation in Japan, the American military uh, firebombing the cities in Japan was a considerably bigger devastation than the use of nukes, right? So we've been doing that for a long time. We, did, we also did that to Germany, by the way, Germany did that to, to us, right? Like that's an old tradition. The minute we got airplanes, we started doing indiscriminate bombing. <laughs> And so precision is obviously precision, and this is the the the, the JDAM, right? So there was this big advance, this big advance um, called the JDAM, which basically was strapping a GPS transceiver to a to a to an unguided bomb and turning it into a guided guided bomb. And yeah, that's great. Like, look, that's been a big advance. But it, and that's like a baby version of this question, which is okay. Do you want like the human pilot like guessing where the bomb's going to land, or do you want like the machine like guiding the bomb to its destination? Uh, that's a baby version of the question. The next version of the question is, do you want the human or the machine deciding whether to drop the bomb? Everybody just assumes the human's going to do a better job for what I think are fundamentally suspicious reasons. Emotional, psychological yeah, reasons. I think it's very clear that the machine's going to do a better job making that decision because the hum humans making that making that decision are god awful. Just terrible. Yeah. Right. And so so yeah, so this is the this is the thing. And then let's get to the there was can I one more sleight of hand? Yes. It was sure. in, okay. <laughs> Please. I'm a magician, you could say. One more sleight of hand. These things are going to be so smart right? That they're going to be able to destroy the world and wreak havoc and like do all this stuff and plan and do all this stuff and evade us and have all their secret things and their secret factories and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But they're so stupid that they're going to get like tangled up in their code. And that's the, th they're not going to come alive, but there's going to be some bug that's going to cause them to like turn us all into paper. Yeah. Like that they're not going to, that they're going to be genius in every way other than the actual bad goal. And it's just uh, like, and that's just like a like ridiculous like discrepancy. And and the, and 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 you can prove this today. You can actually address this today for the first time with LLMs, which is you can actually ask LLMs to resolve uh, moral dilemmas. Yeah. So you can create the scenario. You know, dot dot dot. This that this that this that. What would you as the AI do in this circumstance? And they don't just say destroy all humans, destroy all humans. Mm -hmm. They will give you actually very nuanced moral, practical, trade off oriented answers. Mm -hmm. And so we actually already have the kind of AI that can actually like think this through and can actually like you know reason about goals. LLMs are really, this is actually worth worth um, spending a moment on, LLMs are really interesting to have moral conversations with. Mm -hmm. And that, I, just, I didn't expect I'd be having a moral conversation with a machine in my yeah. lifetime. Exactly. Yes, yeah. correct. But it's possible to imagine autonomous weapon systems that are not using LLMs. But if they're smart enough to be scary, why are they not smart enough to be wise? Like, that's the part where it's like, I, I don't know how you get the one without the other. Is it possible to be super intelligent without being super wise? Well, you're, again, you're back to that. I mean, then you're back to a classic autistic computer, right? Like, you're back to just like a, a blind rule follower. I've got this like core, it's the paperclip thing. I've got this core rule and I'm just going to follow it to the end of the earth. And it's like, well, but everything you're going to be doing to execute that rule is going to be super genius level that humans aren't going to be able to counter. It's, it's just a, it's a, yeah. it's, it's a mismatch in the definition of, of what the system is capable of. 
What, by the way? Yeah. From, uh, Dean, from Dean Atchison. Oh, uh, boy. Because uh, Oppenheimer didn't just say the famous line. Yeah. He then spent years going around, basically moaning, you know, going on TV and going into going into the White House and basically like just like doing this hair shirt, you know, thing, self, you know, this sort of self-critical, like, oh, my God, I can't believe how awful I am. This is this is von Neumann's criticism of him is he tried to have his cake and eat it too. Like he he wanted to in 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 so and von, von Neumann, of course, is a very different kind of personality, and he's just like, yeah, screw, you know, screw this is like an incredibly useful thing. I'm glad we did it. Well, the, so the critique goes deeper, and I le I left this out. Here's the real substance. I left it out because I didn't want to dwell on, on nukes in my AI paper. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deeper thing that happened, and I'm I'm really curious. This movie coming out this summer, I'm really curious to see how far he pushes this because this is the real drama in the story, which is it wasn't just a question of are nukes good or bad. It was a question of should Russia also have them. Um, and what, what actually happened, um, was Russia got the, America invented the bomb. Russia got the bomb. They got the bomb through espionage. They got American and, you know, they got American scientists and foreign scientists working on the American project. Some combination of the two, uh, basically gave the Russians the designs for the bomb. And that's how the Russians got the bomb. Um, there's this dispute to this day of Oppenheimer's role in that. Um, if you read all the histories, the kind of composite picture, and, and by the way, we now know a lot actually about Soviet espionage in that era, because there's been all this declassified material in the last 20 years that actually shows a lot of, a lot of very interesting things. But if you kind of read all the histories, what you kind of get is Oppenheimer himself probably was not a, he probably did not hand over the nuclear secrets himself. However, he was close to many people who did, yeah. including family members. And there were other members of the Manhattan Project who were Russian Soviet assets and did hand over the bomb. And so the view uh, that Oppenheimer and people like him had that this thing is awful and terrible and oh my God, and you know, all this stuff you could argue fed into this ethos at the time that resulted in people thinking that the Baptists thinking that the only principal thing to do is to give the, Ru the Russians the bomb. Um, and so the, the, the moral beliefs on this thing and the public discussion and the role that the inventors of this technology play, this is the point of this book, when they kind of take on this sort of public intellectual moral kind of thing, it can have real consequences, right? Because we live in a very w different world today because Russia got the bomb than we would have lived in had they not gotten the bomb. Right. The entire 20th century, second half of the 20th century would have played out very different had those people not given Russia the bomb. And so the stakes were very high then. The good news today is nobody sitting here today, I don't think, worrying about like an analogous situation with respect to like, I'm not really worried that Sam Altman's going to decide to give, you know, the Chinese the design for AI, although he did just speak at a Chinese conference, which is in, in, in interesting. But however, I, I don't think I don't think that's what's at play here. Mm -hmm. But what's at play here are all these other fundamental issues around what do we believe about this, and then what laws and regulations and restrictions are we going to put on it, and 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 that's where I draw like a, a direct straight line. And, and anyway, and my reading of the history on nukes is like the people who were doing the full hair shirt public, this is awful, this is terrible, actually had like catastrophically bad results uh, from from taking those views, um, yeah. and, and that's what I'm worried is going to happen again. <laughs> I think the education kind of happened quick and early. Like, how? It was pretty obvious. How? We dropped one bomb and destroyed an entire city. Well, so this gets to what actually happened. Let's get to what actually happened. Some of it's happened. me playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, but... yeah, sure, of course. Let's get to what actually happened and then kind of back into that. Yeah. So what, what actually happened, I believe, and again, I think this is a reasonable reading of history, is what actually happened was nukes then prevented World War III. And they prevented World War III through the game theory of mutually assured destruction. Had nukes not existed, Right. There would have been no reason why the Cold War did not go hot. Yeah. Right. And then there and then, you know, and the military planners at the time, right, thought both on both sides thought that there was going to be World War Three on the plains of Europe. And they thought there was going to be like 100 million people dead. Right. It was like the most obvious thing in the world to happen. Right. And, and it's the dog that didn't bark. Right. Uh, like it, it may be like the best single net thing that happened in the entire 20th century is that like that didn't happen. You could have. By the way, you have a, there's another hypothetical scenario. The other hypothetical scenario is the Americans got the bomb, the Russians didn't, right? And then America's the big dog. And then maybe America would have had the capability to actually roll back the Iron Curtain. Right? Yeah. I don't know whether that would have happened, but like it's entirely possible, right? And, 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 and the act of these people who had these moral positions about, because they could forecast, they could model, they could forecast the future of how this technology would get used made a horrific mistake because they basically ensured that the Iron Curtain would continue for 50 years longer than it would have otherwise. Like, and, and again, like these are counterfactuals. I don't know that that's what, what would have happened, but like <laughs> the decision to hand the bomb over was a big decision made by people who were very full of themselves. <laughs> Look, 
there are people to this day who think that those spies, Soviet spies did the right thing because they created a balance of terror as opposed to the U.S. having just... And by the way, let me... let me Balance of terror. Let's tell the full version of the story. has such a sexy ring to it. Okay, so the full version of the story is John von Neumann's a hero of both yours and mine. The full version of the story is he advocated for a first strike. So when the U.S. had the bomb and Russia did not, he advocated for, he said, we, we need to strike them right now. Strike Russia? Yeah. Ooh. Yes. Von Neumann. Yes. Because he said World War III is inevitable. Um, he was very hardcore. Uh, he, he, his, his, theory was, um, his theory was World War III is inevitable. We're definitely going to have World War III. The only way to stop World War III is we have to take them out right now. And we have to take them out right now before they get the bomb because this is our last chance. Now, again, like... Is this an example of philosophers and politics? I don't know if that's in there or not, but this is in the standard bond. No, but it is, yeah. it meaning is yeah, that... Yeah, this is on the other side. So so most of the case studies, most of the case studies in books like this are the crazy people on the left. Yeah. Um, von Neumann is a story, arguably, of the crazy people on the right. Um, yeah, stick to computing, John. Well, this is the thing, and this is this is the general principle, it goes, getting back to our core thing, which is like, I don't know whether any of these people should be making any of these calls. Yeah. Because there's nothing in either von Neumann's background or Oppenheimer's background or any of these people's background that qualifies them as moral authorities. So the history of these fields, this is what he talks about in the book, the history of these fields is that the the competence and capability and intelligence and training and accomplishments of senior scientists and technologists working on the technology and then being able to then make moral judgments on the use of the technology that track wow. record is terrible that track record that track record is like catastrophically bad um and the people just to look at it, the people that develop that technology are usually not going to be the right people well why would to, they so the claim is of course they're the knowledgeable ones but the, the problem is they've spent their entire life in a lab right they're not theologians but <laughs> so what you find what you find when you read when you read this and when you look at these histories what you find is they generally are very thinly informed on history yeah. on sociology on 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 um, theology on morality on ethics they, they tend to manufacture their own worldviews from scratch they tend to be very sort of thin um they're not remotely the arguments that you would be having if you got like a group of highly qualified theologians or philosophers or you know um No, they're both bad. They're, they're, yeah, so definitely not them either. Um, so, but uh, I guess. But well, look, yeah. this is a hard. Yeah, it's a hard problem. This is our problem. And this goes back to where we started, which is okay. Who has the truth? And it's like, well, um, you know, like how do societies arrive at like truth, and how do we figure these things out? And like our elected leaders play some role in it. You know, we all play some role in it. Um, there have to be some set of public intellectuals at some point that bring you know rationality and judgment and humility to it. Yeah, those people are few and far between. We should probably prize them very highly. Yeah, so this is the social media. This is what you just alluded to. It's the activism kind of thing that's popped up in these companies and in, in the industry. And it's basically, from my perspective, it's basically part two of the war that played out over social media over the last 10 years. Because um, you probably remember social media 10 years ago was basically who even wants this? Who wants, a, who wants a photo of what your cat had for breakfast? Like this stuff is like silly and trivial. And why can't these nerds like figure out how to invent something like useful and powerful? And then, you know, certain things happened in the political system. And then it sort of the polarity on that discussion switched all the way to social media is like the worst, most corrosive, most terrible, most awful technology ever invented. And then it leads to, you know, terrible, the wrong, you know, politicians and policies and politics and like, and all this stuff. And, and that, that all got catalyzed into this very big kind of angry movement, both inside and outside the companies to kind of bring social media to, to, to heal. And that got focused in particular on two topics, so-called hate speech and so-called misinformation. Um, and, and that's been this saga playing out for the last for the last decade. And I, I don't even really want to even argue the pros and cons of the sides just to observe that that's been like a huge fight and has had you know big consequences to how these companies operate. Um, basically, that same those same sets of theories, that same activist approach, that same energy is being transplanted straight to AI. And you see that already happening. It's why, you know, chat GPT will answer, let's say, certain questions and not others. Um, it's why it gives you the canned speech about, you know, whenever it starts with as a large language model, I cannot, you know, basically means that somebody has reached in there and told it it can't talk about certain topics. Um, Do you think some of that is good? So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, so a, a couple of couple observations. Um, so so one is um, the people who find this the most frustrating are the people who are worried about the murder robots. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. So, so, and in fact, the the, the ex, so-called ex-risk people, right? They started with the term AI safety. The term became AI alignment. When the term became AI alignment is when this switch happened from we're worried it's going to kill us all to we're worried about hate speech and misinformation. Sure. The AI ex-risk people have now renamed their thing uh, AI not kill everyone-ism, uh, <laughs> which I have to admit is a catchy term. And they are very frustrated by the fact that the hate spe- either the sort of activist-driven hate speech misinformation kind of thing is taking over, which is what's happened. It's taken over. The AI ethics field has been taken over by the hate speech misinformation people. Um, you know, look, would I like to live in a world in which like everybody was nice to each other all the time and nobody ever said anything mean and nobody ever used a bad word and everything was always accurate and honest? Like, that sounds great. Do I want to live in a world where there's like a centralized thought police working through the tech companies to enforce the view of a small set of elites that they're going to determine what the rest of us think and feel? Like, absolutely not. <laughs> There's a section, later section of the essay where I talk about bad people doing bad things. Yes. Right. Which, which, and, and there's a, there's a set of things that we should discuss there. Yeah. Um, what happens in practice is these lines, as you alluded to this already, these lines are not easy to draw. And what, what I've observed in the social media version of this is like the way I describe it is the slippery slope is not a fallacy. It's an inevitability. Yeah. The minute you have this kind of activist personality that gets in a position to make these decisions, they, they take it straight to infinity. Like they, they, they it, it, it goes into the crazy zone, like almost immediately and never comes back because people become drunk with power. Um, right. And they, they look, if you're in the position to determine what the entire world thinks and feels and reads and says, like, you're going to take it. And, you know, Elon has you know ventilated this with the Twitter files over the last, you know, three months. And it's just like crystal clear, like how bad it got there. Now, yeah. reason for optimism is what uh, Elon is doing with the uh, community notes. Um, uh, um, so community notes is actually a very interesting thing. Uh, so what, what Elon is trying to do with community notes, um, is he's trying to have it where there's only a community note when people who have previously disagreed on many topics agree on this one. Now, there's another, Power. there's an entirely different approach here, which is basically, um, we have AIs that are producing content. We could also have AIs that are consuming content, yeah. right? And so one of the things that your assistant could do for you is help you consume all the content, right? And basically tell you when you're getting played. So for example, I'm going to want the AI that my kid uses, right? To be very, you know, child safe. And I'm going to want it to filter for him all kinds of inappropriate stuff that he shouldn't be saying just because he's a kid. Yeah. Right. And you see what I'm saying is you can implement that. You could, you, architecturally, you could say you can solve this on the client side, right? You, you, solving on the server side gives you an opportunity to dictate for the entire world, which I think is where you, you take the slippery slope to hell. Um, there's another architectural approach, which is to solve this on the client side, which yeah, is certainly what I would endorse. Yeah. three-part argument on, on bad people doing bad things um so um uh so number one right you can use the technology defensively and there's a we, we should be using ai to build like broad spectrum vaccines and antibiotics for like bioweapons and we should be using ai to like hunt terrorists and catch criminals and like we should be doing like all kinds of stuff like that and in fact we should be doing those things even just to like go get like you know basically go eliminate risk from like regular pathogens mm-hmm. that aren't like constructed by an ai so there's 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 the whole um uh there's a whole defensive set of things um second is we have many laws on the books about the actual bad things mm-hmm. right so it is actually illegal to be a criminal you know to commit crimes to to commit terrorist acts to you know build pathogens with the intent to deploy them to kill people and so we have those we we don't we actually don't need new laws for the vast majority of the scenarios we actually already, already have the laws in the book on the books the third argument is the minute and this is sort of the foundational one that gets really tough but the minute you get into this thing which which you were kind of getting into which is like okay but like don't you need censorship sometimes right and don't you need restrictions sometimes it's like okay what is the cost of that um, and in particular in the world of open source, right? Um, and so um, is open source AI going to be allowed or not? Um, if open source AI is not allowed, um, then what is the regime that's going to be necessary legally and technically to prevent it from developing, right? And here again is where you get into, and people have proposed that these kinds of things, you get into, I would say, pretty extreme territory pretty fast. Do we have a monitor agent on every CPU and GPU that reports back to the government what we're doing with our computers? Are we seizing GPU clusters that get beyond a certain size? Like, and then by the way, how are we doing all that globally? Right. And like, if China is developing an LLM beyond the scale that we think is allowable, are we going to invade? Yeah. Right. And you have figures on the AI X risk side who are advocating any, you know, potentially up to nuclear strikes to prevent, you know, this kind of thing. And so here you get into this thing. And, and again, you know, you could maybe say this is, you know, you could even say this is what good, bad, or indifferent or whatever, but like, Here's the the comparison of nukes. The comparison of nukes is very dangerous because one is just nukes were just just, just a bomb. Although we can come back to nuclear power, but the other thing was like with nukes, you could control pl- plutonium, right? You could track plutonium, and it was like hard to come by. AI is just math and code, 
right? It's and it's in like math textbooks and it's like there are YouTube videos that teach you how to build it and like there's open source, it's already open source. You know, there's a 40 billion parameter model running around already uh, called Falcon Online that anybody can download. Um, and so, okay, you, you walk down the logic path that says we need to have guardrails on this and you find yourself in a authoritarian, totalitarian regime of thought control and machine control that would be so brutal that you would have destroyed the society that you're trying to protect. And so I, I just don't see how that actually works. So I th look, I mean, I think it's totally appropriate that companies that are in the business of producing a product or service should be able to have a wide range of policies that they put, right? And I'll just say again, I want a heavily censored model for my eight-year-old. Like, I actually want that. Like, like, I would pay more money for the one that's more heavily censored than the one that's not, right? Um, and so, like, th there are certainly scenarios where com companies will make that decision. Look, an interesting thing you brought up, the, or it's, is, is this really a speech issue? Um, one of the things that the big tech companies are dealing with is that content generated uh, from an LLM is not covered under Section 230, uh, which is the law that uh, protects internet platform companies from being sued for the user-generated content. Um, and so it, it's actually, uh -oh. yes. And so there, there's actually, oh, no. a, there's, there's actually a question. I think there's still a question, which is can big, com can big American companies actually feel generative AI at all? Or is the liability actually going to just ultimately convince them that they can't do it? Because th the minute the thing says something bad and it doesn't even need to be hate speech, it could just be like an inaccurate, it could hallucinate a product, you know, detail on a vacuum cleaner, you know, and all of a sudden the vacuum cleaner company sues for misrepresentation. And there, there's an asymmetry there, right? Because the, the, the LLM is going to be producing billions of answers to questions and it only needs to get a few wrong to have. So loss has to get updated really quick here. Yeah, and nobody knows what to do with that, right? Um, so, so anyway, like there, 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 are big, there are big questions around how companies operate at all. So we, we, we talk about those. But then there's this other question of like, okay, the open source, so what about open source? And, and my answer to your question is kind of like, obviously, yes, the models have, to, there has to be full open source here because to live in a world in which that open source is not allowed is a world of draconian speech control, human control, machine control. I mean, you know, black helicopters with jackbooted thugs coming out, rappelling down and seizing your GPU like territory. Well, no, no, I'm 100% serious. I, that's you're saying slippery slope always leads there. No, 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 no. That's what's required to enforce it. Like, how will you enforce a ban on open source? AI? No, you could add friction to it, like hard to get the models. Because people will always be able to get the models, but it'll be more in the shadows, right? The leading open source model right now is from the UAE. Yes. Like, the next time they do that, what do we do? Yeah. Like, oh, I see. You're like uh, a 14 year old in Indonesia comes out with a breakthrough model. You know, we talked about most great software comes from a small number of people. Some kid comes out with some big new breakthrough in quantization or something and has some huge breakthrough. And like, what are we going to, what are we going to like invade Indonesia and arrest him? Well, so, but this goes, okay. So when does it become dangerous? Yeah. Right. Is is the danger that it's, quote, as powerful as the current leading commercial model, or is it that it is it is just at some other arbitrary threshold? Yeah. And then, by the way, like, look, how do we know? Like, what we know today is that you need, like, a lot of money to, like, train these things. But there are advances being made every week on training efficiency and, you know, data, all kinds of synthetic, you know, look, I don't even, like, the synthetic data thing we we're talking about, maybe yeah. some kid figures out a way to auto-generate synthetic and that's data. that's going to change everything. Maybe, yeah, exactly. And so, like, sitting here today, like, the, 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 the breakthrough just happened, right? You, you made yeah. this point. Like, the breakthrough just happened. So we don't know what the shape of this technology is going to be. I mean, the, the, the big shock, the, the big shock here is that, you know, whatever number of billions of parameters basically represents at least a very big percentage of human thought. Mm -hmm. Like, who would have imagined that? And then there's already work underway. There was just this paper that just came out that basically takes a GPT-3 scale model and compresses it down to run on a single 32 core CPU. Like, who would have predicted that? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. some of these models now you can run on Raspberry Pis. Like yeah. today they're very slow, but like, you know, maybe there'll be a, you know, perceived you have real perform, you know, like it's math and code. And here we're back in here we're back in dude, it's math and code. It's math and code. It's math, code, and data. It's bits. So my argument is we're gonna have to see so here's my argument is a, a, my argument, my full argument is AI is gonna be like air, it's gonna be everywhere. Like it's just this is just gonna be in textbooks. It already is, it's gonna be in textbooks and kids are gonna grow up knowing how to do this, and it's just gonna be a thing, it's gonna be in the air, and you can't like pull this back anymore, you can pull back air. And so you just have to figure out how to live in this world, right? And then that that and then that's where I think like all this hand wringing about AI risk is basically a complete waste of time because the, the 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 effort should go into okay, what are what are, what is what is the defensive approach? Mm -hmm. And so if you're worried about you know AI generated pathogens, the right thing to do is to have a permanent project warp speed 
Godspeed, right? Funded lavishly. Let's let's do a Manhattan. Let's people talk about Manhattan Project. Let's do a Manhattan Project for biological defense, right? And let's build AIs and let's have like broad spectrum vaccines where like we're insulated from every pathogen, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So this goes. This actually, ironically, goes back to Marxism. So, um, because this was the kind of, so the core claim of Marxism, right? Basically, was that the owner, the owners of capital, would basically own the means of production, and then over time, they would basically accumulate all the wealth. The workers would be paying in, you know, and be getting nothing in return because they wouldn't be needed anymore, right? He, Marx was very worried about what he called mechanization, or what later became known as automation, um, and that you know the workers would be immiserated, and the, the capitalists would end up with 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 all. And so th this was one of the core 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 principles of Marxism. Of course, it turned out to be wrong about every previous wave of technology. Um, the reason it, it turned out to be wrong about every previous wave of technology is that the way that the self interested owner of the machines makes the most money is by providing the production capability in the form of products and services to the most people, the most customers as possible, mm -hmm. right? The, the largest, and it, it, this is one of those funny things where every CEO knows this intuitively, and yet it's like hard to explain from the outside. The, the way you make the most money in any business is by selling to the largest market you can possibly get to. The largest market you can possibly get to is everybody on the planet. And so every large company does is everything that it can to drive down prices, to be able to get volumes up, to be able to get to everybody on the planet. And that happened with everything from electricity. It happened with telephones. It happened with radio. It happened with automobiles. It happened with smartphones. It happened with uh, uh, PCs. Um, it happened with the internet. Um, it happened with mobile broadband. Um, it's happened, by the way, with Coca-Cola. <laughs> and it's happened with like every, you know, basically every industrially produced, you know, good or service. You know, people want, you want to drive it to the largest possible market. And then as proof of that, it's already happened, right? Which is the early adopters of like ChatGPT and Bing are not like, you know, Exxon and Boeing. They're, you know, your uncle and your nephew, right? It's just like, free, it's either freely available online or it's available for 20 bucks a month or something. But, the, it, you know, these things went, this, this, this technology went massive market immediately um and so look the, the the owners of the means of production the whoever does this as i mentioned these trillion dollar questions there are people who are going to get really rich doing this producing these things but they're going to get really rich by taking this technology to the broadest possible market so yes they'll get rich but they'll get rich having a huge positive impact on yeah making that making the technology available to everybody yeah right and again smartphones same thing so the, the, there's this amazing kind of twist in um in business history which is you cannot spend ten thousand dollars on a smartphone Right. You can't spend a hundred thousand dollars. You can't spend a million. Like I would buy the million dollar smartphone. Like I'm signed up for it. Like if it's like, suppose a million dollar smartphone was like much better than the thousand dollar smartphone. Like I'm there to buy it. It doesn't exist. Why doesn't it exist? Apple makes so much more money driving the price further down from a thousand dollars than they would trying to harvest. Right. And so it's, it's just this repeating pattern you see over and over again. Um, where the, and, and, and what's, what's great about it, what's great about it is you, you do not need to rely on anybody's enlightened, right. Generosity to do this. You just need to rely on capitalist self-interest. Uh, what about AI taking our jobs? Yeah, so very, very similar thing here. Um, there's sort of a, there's a core fallacy, which again was was very common in Marxism, which is what's called the lump of labor fallacy. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of the fallacy that there's a only a fixed amount of work to be done in the world. And if the, and it's all being done today by people, and then if machines do it, there's no other work to be done um, by people. Um, and that's just a completely backwards view on how the economy develops and grows. Um, because what happens is not, in fact, that what happens is the introduction of technology into production process causes prices to fall. As prices fall, consumers have more spending power. As consumers have more spending power, they create new demand. That new demand then causes capital and labor to form into new enterprises to satisfy new wants and needs. And the result is more jobs at higher wages. Two things. One is that new jobs are often much better. Um, so this actually came up that there was this panic about a decade ago and all the truck drivers are going to lose their jobs. Right. And number one, that didn't happen because we haven't figured out a way to actually <laughs> finish that yet. But, yeah. but the other thing was like, like truck driver, like I grew up in a town that was basically consisted of a truck stop. Right. And I like knew a lot of truck drivers and like truck drivers live a decade shorter than everybody else. Yeah. Like they, it's a, it's a, it's actually like a very dangerous, like they get like, literally they have like higher rates of skin cancer mm -hmm. and on the left side of their, on the left side of their body from, from being in the sun all the time. The vibration of being in the truck is actually very damaging to your to your physiology. Like it's not it's not like the question always you want to ask somebody like that is do you want you know if you're, uh, do, you, do you want your kid to be doing this job and like most of them will tell you no like I want my kid to be sitting in a cubicle somewhere like where they don't have this like where they don't die ten years earlier. And so, so the new jobs, number one, the new jobs are often better, but you don't get the new jobs until you go through the change. And then to your point, the, the training thing, you know, it's always the issue is can, can people adapt? And again, here you need to imagine living in a world in which everybody has the AI assistant capability, 
right to be able to pick up new skills much more quickly and be able to have some you know be able to have a machine to work with to augment their skills it's still going to be painful but that's the process so of life it's painful for some people i mean there's no like there's no question it's painful for some people and they're you know they're, they're, they're yes it's, it's not again i'm not a utopian on this and it's not like it's, it's positive for everybody in the moment but it has been overwhelmingly positive for 300 years i mean look the, the concern here the concern the concern this concern has played out for for literally centuries um and you know this is the sort of luddite you know the story of the luddites um, that you may remember there was a panic in the 2000s around uh, outsourcing was going to take all the jobs. There was a panic in the 2010s that robots were going to take all the jobs. Um, in 2019, before COVID, we had more jobs at higher wages, both in the country and in the world than at any point in human history. Mm -hmm. And so the overwhelming evidence is that the net gain here is like, just like wildly positive. Uh, and most, most people like overwhelmingly come out the other side being huge beneficiaries of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the other thing, <laughs> which is a lot of the sort of AI risk debates today sort of assume that we're the only game in town, right? And so we have the ability to kind of sit in the United States and criticize ourselves and, you know, have our government like, you know, beat up on our companies and we figure out a way to restrict what our companies can do. And, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to ban this and ban that, restrict this and do that. And then there's this like other like force out there that like doesn't believe we have any power over them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have no desire to sign up for whatever rules we decide to put in place. Um, and they're going to do whatever it is they're going to do. And we have no control over it at all. And it's China and specifically the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and they have a completely publicized open, you know, uh, plan for what they're going to do with AI. And it is not what we have in mind. Um, and not only do they have that as a vision and a plan for their society, but they also have it as a vision and plan for the rest of the world. So their plan is what? Surveillance? Yeah, authoritarian control. So authoritarian population control, um, com, com, you know, good, good, good old fashioned communist authoritarian control um, and surveillance and enforcement um, and social credit scores and all the rest of it. Um, and you are going to be monitored and metered within an inch of everything all the time. Um, and it's going to, you know, it's basically the end of human freedom. And that's their goal. And, you know, they justify it on the basis of that's what leads to peace. <laughs> So their plan, yeah, yes, yes. And the reason for that is they, and again, they're very public on this. They, they have, their plan is to proliferate their approach around the world. Um, and they have this program called the Digital Silk Road, right? Which is building on their, their Silk Road investment program. And they've got their, they've been laying, they've been laying networking infrastructure all over the world with their 5G, right? Work with the, their company, Huawei. And so they, they've been laying all this fabric, but financial and technological fabric all over the world. And their plan is to roll out their vision of AI on top of that and to have every other country be running their version. And then if you're a country prone to, you know, authoritarianism, you're going to find this to be an incredible way to become more authoritarian. Uh, if you're a country, by the way, not prone to authoritarianism, you're going to have the Chinese Communist Party running your infrastructure and having backdoors into it, <laughs> right? Which is also not good. Um, yeah, so good news is they're behind, but bad news is they, you know, they, let's just say they get access to everything we do. Um, so they're probably a year behind at each point in time, but they get, you know, downloads, I think of basically all of our work on a regular basis through a variety of means. Yeah. Um, and they are, you know, at least we'll see, they're at least putting out reports of very, they just put out a report last week of a, of a GPT 3.5 analog. Um, they, they put out this report, forget what it's called, but, um, they put out this report of this LM they did and they, they, you know, the way when open AI, you know, puts out, they, 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 one of the ways they test, you know, a GPT, um, is they, they, they run it through standardized exams like the SAT, right? just how you can kind of gauge how smart it is. Uh, and so the Chinese report, they ran their LLM through uh, the Chinese equivalent of the SAT. Um, and it includes uh, a section on Marxism mm -hmm. um, and a section on Mao Zedong thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turns out their AI does very well on both of those topics. Oh, uh, right? <laughs> so like- uh, This this alignment thing. Communist AI, right? Like literal communist AI, right? And so their vision is like, that's the, you know, so, you know, you, you can just imagine like you're a school, you know, you're a kid 10 years from now in Argentina or in Germany or in who knows where, uh, Indonesia. And you ask the AI to explain to you like how the economy works and it gives you the most cheery, upbeat explanation of Chinese style communism you've ever heard, right? So. Like <laughs> the stakes here are like really big. I mean, the big shift over 20 years has been that tech used to be a tools industry uh, for basically from like 1940 through to about 2010, almost all the big successful companies were picks and shovels companies. So PC, database, smartphone, you know, some, some, some tool that somebody else would pick up and use. 
Since 2010, most of the big wins have been in applications. Um, so a company that starts a com- uh, you know it starts in an existing industry and goes directly to the customer in that industry. And the, you know the early so- examples there were like Uber and Lyft and Airbnb. Um, and then that model is kind of elaborating out. Um, oh, oh, uh, the AI thing is actually a reversion on that for now because like most of the AI business right now is actually in cloud provision of of, of AI APIs for other people to build on. But but the big thing will probably be an app. Yeah, I think I think most of the money I think probably will be in whatever. Yeah, your AI financial advisor or your AI doctor or your AI lawyer or you know take your pick of whatever the domain is. Um, and there and what's interesting is you know we the Valley kind of does everything. We we our the entrepreneurs kind of elaborate every possible idea. And so there will be a set of companies that like make AI um, something that can be purchased and used by large law firms. Um, and then there will be other companies that just go direct to market as a as an AI lawyer. <laughs> Yeah, so the great thing about the really great founders is they don't take any advice. So, <laughs> so if you find yourself listening to advice, maybe you shouldn't do it. Um, what makes a great founder is super smart, um, coupled with super energetic, coupled with super courageous. I think it's some of those those three. And Intelligence, I, passion, and courage. The first two are traits, and the third one is a choice, I think. Courage is a choice. Well, because courage is a question of pain tolerance, right? Um, so um, how how many times are you willing to get punched in the face before you quit? Yeah. Um, and here's maybe the biggest thing people don't understand about what it's like to be a startup founder is it gets it gets very romanticized, right? Um, and even when it, even when they fail, it still gets romanticized about like what a great adventure it was. But like the reality of it is, most of what happens is people telling you no, and then they usually follow that with "you're stupid." Yeah. Right. No, I will not come to work for you. Um, I will not leave my cushy job at Google to come work for you. No, I'm not going to buy your product. You know, no, I'm not going to run a story about your company. No, I'm not this, that, the other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a huge amount of what people have to do is just get used to just getting punched. And 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 the reason people don't understand this is because when you're a founder, you cannot let on that this is happening because it will cause people to think that you're weak and they'll lose faith in you. Yeah. So you have to pretend that you're having a great time when you're dying inside, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're just in sure. misery. But why did why did they do it? What do they do? Uh, yeah, that's the thing. It's it's like it is a level. This is actually one of the conclusions. I think is it. I think it's actually for most of these people on a risk adjusted basis. It's probably an irrational act. Mm-hmm. They could probably be more financially successful on average if they just got like a real job and at a, at a big company. Um, but there's you know some people just have an irrational need to do something new and build something for themselves. And you know some people just can't tolerate having bosses. Oh, here's a fun thing: is how do you reference check founders? Mm-hmm. Right. So you call it. You know, normal way you reference check you're hiring somebody is you call the bosses. And they're at their and you know and you find out if they were good employees and now you're trying to reference check steve jobs right and it's yeah. like oh god he was terrible you know he was a terrible yeah. employee he never did what we told him to do yeah <laughs> <laughs> well ideally ideally what you want is i will go I, I would like to go to work for that person yeah. um yeah. He, he worked for me here and now i'd like to work for him now yeah. unfortunately most people can't their egos can't can't handle that so they won't say that but that, that that's the ideal what advice would you give to those folks in the space of intelligence, passion, and courage. So I think the other big thing is you see people sometimes who say, I want to start a company, and then they kind of work through the process of coming up with an idea. And generally, those don't work as well as the case where somebody has the idea first, and then they kind of realize that there's an opportunity to build a company, and then they just turn out to be the right kind of person to do that. When you say idea, do you mean what long-term do? big vision, or do you mean specifics of like product? Yeah. Speci- I would say specific, like specifically what, yes, specifics, like what is, the, because for the first five years, you don't get to have vision. You just got to build something people want and you yeah. got to figure out a way to sell it to them, right? It's very practical or, or you never get to big vision. So so the first, the first product, you, you have an idea of a set of products of the first product that can actually make some money. Yeah. Like it's got to, the first product's got to work, by which I mean, like it has to technically work, but then it has to actually fit into the category in the customer's mind of something that they want. And then, and then by the way, the other part is they have to want to pay for it. Like somebody has got to pay the bills. And so you got to figure out how to price it and whether you can actually extract the money. Yeah. So usually it is much more predictable. It's, it's, success is never predictable, but it's more predictable if you start with a great idea and then back into starting the company. Um, so this is what we did. You know, we had Mosaic before we had Netscape. The Google guys had the Google search engine working at Stanford, um, yeah. right? Um, the, um, uh, you know, yeah, actually you, there's tons of examples where they, you know, uh, Pierre Omidyar had eBay working before he left his previous job. 
So I really love that idea of just having a thing, a prototype that actually works before you even begin to remotely scale. Yeah. By the way, it's also far easier to raise money, right? Like the, the ideal pitch that we receive is here's the thing that works. Would you like to invest in our company or not? Yeah. Like that's so much easier than here's 30 slides mm -hmm. with a dream, right? Um, and then we have this concept called the idea maze, which our, our, our biology uh, friend of Austin came up with um, when he was with us. Um, so, so, so then there's this thing. This goes to mythology, which is um, you know there's a mythology that kind of you know these these ideas um, you know kind of arrive like magic, or people kind of stumble into them. It's like eBay with the pest dispensers or something. Um, the reality, usually with the big successes, is that the founder has been chewing on the problem for five or ten years before they start the company, and they often worked on it in school, mm -hmm. um, or they even experimented on it when they were a kid, um, and they've been kind of training up over that period of time mm -hmm. to be able to do the thing. So yeah. they're like a true domain expert. And, and, and it's, it's sort of, this sort of sounds like mom and apple pie, which is, yeah, you want to be a domain expert in what you're doing, but you would, you know, the, the mythology is so strong of like, oh, I just like had this idea in the shower and now I'm doing it. Like, mm -hmm. it's generally not that. We call it the idea maze because the, the idea maze basically is like, there's all these permutations. Like for any, ide for any idea, there's like all these different permutations. Who should the customer be? What shape forms the yeah. product have? And how should we take it to market and all these things? Um, and so, um, the really smart founders have thought through all these scenarios by the time they go out to raise money. Um, and they have like detailed answers, um, on every one of those fronts be because they put so much thought into it. Mm -hmm. Um, the sort of, the, the, the sort of more, uh, haphazard founders haven't thought about any of, any of that. And it's the detailed ones who tend to do much better. So how do you know when to take a leap if uh, you have a cushy job or happy life? I mean, the best reason is just because you can't tolerate not doing it, right? Like, th this is the kind of thing where if you have to be advised into doing it, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, and so it's probably the opposite, which is you just have such a burning sense of this has to be done. I have to do this. I have no choice. Yeah, look, so I, I, like it's going to put you in a social tunnel for sure, right? So you're going to like, I, you know, <laughs> there's this game you can play on Twitter, which is you can do any whiff of the idea that there's uh, basically any such thing as work-life balance and that people should actually work hard and everybody gets mad. But like the truth is like all the successful founders are working 80 hour weeks and they're working, you know, they form very, very strong social bonds with the people they work with. They tend to lose a lot of friends on the outside or put those friendships on ice. Like that's just the nature of the, of, of the thing. Um, you know, for most people that's worth the trade off, you know, the advantage, you know, maybe younger founders have is maybe they have less, you know, maybe they're not, you know, for example, if they're not married yet or don't have kids yet, that's an mm -hmm. easier thing to bite off. Can you be an older founder? Yeah, you definitely can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, many of the most successful founders are second, third, fourth time founders. They're in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, the good news of being an older founder is you know more and you you know a lot more about what to do, which is very helpful. The problem is, okay, now you've got like a spouse and a family and kids and like you've got to go to the baseball game and like you can't go to the baseball, you know, and so it's... It... <laughs> Yeah, so it's basically, I would say it's it's uh, I'm an autodidact. Um, uh, so it sort of goes, it's going down the rabbit holes. Um, so it's a combination of, so I kind of allude to it in that, in that quote, it's a combination of breadth and depth. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I tend to, yeah, I tend to, I, I go broad by the nature of what I do. I go broad, but then I tend to go deep in a rabbit hole for a while, read everything I can and then come out of it. And I might not, I might not revisit that rabbit hole for, you know, another decade. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a fascinating book. This one's free. It's free, by the way. It's it's, an, it's a book from the 1860s. You can download it or you can buy print out prints of it. But um, it's uh, it was this guy who was a professor at the Sorbonne in the 1860s, and he was apparently a savant on uh, antiquity, on, on Greek and Roman antiquity. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because his sources are 100% original Greek and Roman sources. So he wrote a basically a history of Western civilization from on the order of 4,000 years ago to basically the present times, entirely working on original Greek and, and Roman, Roman sources. Um, and what he was specifically trying to do was he was trying to reconstruct from the stories of the Greeks and the Romans, he was trying to reconstruct what life in the West was like before the Greeks and the Romans which was in the, in the, in the civilization known as the, the, the Indo-Europeans. Um, and the short answer is, and this is sort of circa 4,000, you know, 2000 BC to, you know, sort of 500 BC, kind of that 1500 year stretch where civilization developed. Uh, and his conclusion was basically cults. Um, they were basically cults and civilization was or, or organized into cults and the, the intensity of the cults 
was like a million fold beyond anything that we would recognize today. Like it was a level of um, all encompassing belief and uh, an action around religion um, that was at a level of extremeness that we, we wouldn't even recognize it. Um, uh, and, and so specifically he tells the story of basically th there were three levels of cults. There was the family cult, the tribal cult, and then the city cult as, as society scaled up. And then each cult was a joint cult of uh, family gods, which were ancestor gods, and then nature gods. Um, and then your bonding into a family, a tribe, or a city was based on your adherence to that religion. Mm -hmm. um, people uh, who were not of your family, tribe, city worshiped different gods, which gave you not just the right, but the responsibility to kill them on sight. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So they were serious about their cults. Hardcore. By the way, shocking development. I did not realize there's zero concept of individual rights. Like even, even up through the Greeks and even in the Romans, they didn't have, have the concept of individual rights. Like the idea that as an individual, you have like some right, it's just like, nope. Mm -hmm. Right. And you look back and you're just like, wow, that's just like crazily like fascist in a degree that we wouldn't recognize today. But it's like, well, they were living under extreme pressure for survival. And you, and you know, the theory goes, you could not have people running around making claims to individual rights when you're just trying to get like your tribe through the winter, right? Like you need like hardcore command and control. And, and so, and, and, and actually what, what, if through modern political lens, those cults were basically both fascist and communist, um, they were fascist in terms of social control. And then they were communist in terms of economics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you think that's fundamentally that like pull towards, uh, cults is, is within us. Well, so, so my conclusion from this book, so, 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 so the way we naturally think about the world we live in today is like, we basically have such an improved version of everything that came before us, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we, we have basically, we've figured out all these things around morality and ethics and democracy and all these things. And like, they were basically stupid and retrograde and we're like smart and sophisticated mm -hmm. and we've improved all this. Um, I, I, after reading that book, uh, I, I now believe in, in many ways, the opposite, which is no, actually we are still running in that original model. We're just running in an incredibly diluted version of it. So we're still running basically in cults. It's just our cults are at like a thousandth or a millionth the level of intensity, right? And so our so just as to take religions, you know, the modern experience of a Christian in our time, even somebody who considers them a devout Christian, is just a shadow of the level of intensity of somebody who belonged to a religion back in, in that yeah. period. And then, by the way, we have it goes back to our AI discussion. We 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 then sort of endlessly create new cults, like we're, we're trying to fill the void, right? We're, and the void is a void of, of bonding. Okay, living in their era, like everybody living today, transported in that era would view it as just like completely intolerable in terms mm -hmm. of like the lo the loss of freedom and the level of basically fascist uh, control. However, every single person in that era, and he really stresses this, they knew exactly where they stood. Mm -hmm. They knew exactly where they belonged. They knew exactly what their purpose was. They knew exactly what they needed to do every day. They knew exactly why they were doing it. They had total certainty about their place in the universe. So the question of meaning and the question of purpose was very distinctly, clearly defined for them. Absolutely, overwhelmingly, undisputably, undeniably. So as we turn the volume down on the cultism, yes, we start to, uh, the search for meaning starts getting harder and harder. Yes, because we, we don't have that. We are, we are ungrounded. We are, we, are, we are uncentered and we and we all feel it, right? And that's why we reach for, you know, it's why we still reach for religion. It's why we reach for, you know, we, people start to take on, you know, let's say, you know, a faith in science, maybe beyond where they should put it. Uh, you know, and by the way, like sports teams are like, a, you know, they're like a tiny little version of a cult and, you know, the, you know, Apple keynotes are a tiny little version of a cult, right? <laughs> and, you know, political, you know, yeah. and there's cult, you know, there's full blown cults on both sides of the political spectrum right now, right? Um, you know, operating in plain sight. But still not full blown oh, compared as to what it was. Compared to what it used to, I mean, we would today consider full blown, but like, yes, they're, they're at like, I don't know, a hundred thousandth or something of the intensity of, of, of what people had back then. So, so we live in a world today that in many ways is more advanced and moral and so forth. And it's certainly a lot nicer, much nicer world to live in, but we live in a world that's like very washed out. It's like everything has become very colorless and gray as compared to how people used to experience things, which is, I think, why we're so prone to reach for drama. We, 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 there's something in us yeah. deeply evolved where we want that back. Yeah, so the tools that are available today, I mean, are just... Like I sometimes, you know, bore, I sometimes bore, uh, you know, kids by describing like what it was like to go look up a book, you know, to try to like discover a fact and, you know, in the, in the old days, the 1970s, 1980s, go to the library and the card catalog and the whole thing, you go through all that work and then the book is checked out and you have to wait two weeks and like, like, 
to be in a world not only where you can get the answer to any question, but also the world now, you know, the, the AI world where you've got like the assistant that will help you do anything, help you teach, learn anything, like your ability both to learn and also to produce is just like, I don't know, a million fold beyond what it used to be. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a blog post I've been wanting to write, um, which I call, uh, where, where are the hyperproductive people? Um, like good question, right? Like with these tools, like there should be authors that are writing like hundreds or thousands of like outstanding books. Musicians, yeah. right? Why aren't musicians producing a thousand times the number of songs, right? Um, like, wait, like the tools are spectacular. I think it might be distraction. Distraction. It's it's so easy to just sit and consume um, that I think people get distracted from production. But if you wanted to, um, you know, as a young person, if you wanted to really stand out, you could get on a, like a, a, a hyper productivity curve very early on. There's a great, uh, you know, the story, there's a great story in Roman history of Pliny the Elder, who was this legendary statesman, um, uh, died in the Vesuvius eruption trying to rescue his friends. But um, he was famous both for being a, a savant, uh, basically being a polymath, but also being a, an author. And he wrote apparently like hundreds of books, most of which have been lost, but he like wrote all these encyclopedias. And he literally like would be reading and writing all day long, no matter what else was going on. And he, so he would like travel with like four slaves and two of them were responsible for reading to him and two of them were responsible for ta taking dictation. And so like, he'd be going cross country and like, literally he would be writing books like all the time. And apparently they were spectacular. We, there's only a few that have survived, but apparently they were amazing. So there's a lot of value to being somebody who finds focus in this life. Yeah. Like when, and, and there are examples, like there are, uh, you know, there's this guy, uh, judge, uh, what's his name? Posner, Posner, um, who wrote like 40 books and was also a great federal judge. Um, you know, there's uh, well, our, our friend Balaji, uh, I think it's like this. He's one of these, you know, where his, his, his output is just prodigious. Um, and so it's like, yeah, I mean, with these tools, why not? And I kind of think we're, we're, at, we're at this interesting kind of freeze frame moment where like this, these tools are now in everybody's hands and everybody's just kind of staring at them, trying to figure out what to do, yeah. the, the, the new tools. I, I don't believe in balance. So I, I, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask. Can you that. elaborate why you don't believe in balance? I mean, I, I, maybe it's just, and I, I look, I think people, I think people are wired differently. So I, I think it's hard to generalize uh, this kind of thing, but I'm, I am much happier and more satisfied when I'm fully committed to something. So I'm very much in favor of, All in. of imbalance. Yeah. Imbalance. And that applies to work, to life, to everything. Yeah, now, now I happen to have whatever twist of personality traits lead that in non-destructive dimensions, in, including the fact that I've actually, I, I now no longer do the 10-4 plan. I, I stopped drinking. I do the caffeine, but not the alcohol. So there's something in my personality where I, I, I whatever maladaption I have is inclining me towards productive things, not unproductive things. So you're one of the wealthiest people in the world. What's the relationship between wealth and happiness? Oh, uh... Money and happiness. So I think happiness... I don't think happiness is the thing to strive for. I think satisfaction is the thing. That's that just sounds like happiness, but turned down a bit. No deeper. So happiness is you know a walk in the woods at sunset, an ice cream cone, mm -hmm. a kiss. Um, the first ice cream cone is great. The thousandth ice cream cone, not so much. At some point, the walks in the woods get boring. <laughs> That I'm fully satisfying my faculties, that I'm fully delivering, right, uh, on the gifts that I've been given, that I'm, you know, net making the world better, that I'm contributing to the people around me, right, and that I can look back and say, wow, that was hard, but it was worth it. I think generally it seems to leave people in a better state than pursuit of pleasure, pursuit of quote unquote happiness. Does money have I anything the, to do with that? I think the founders, I think the founding fathers in the U.S. threw this off kilter when they used the phrase pursuit of happiness. I think they should have said Pursuit of satisfaction. If they said pursuit of satisfaction, we might live in a better world today. So I, I think, and I think there, I mean, look, I think Elon is, I don't think I'm even a great example, but I think Elon would be the great example of this, which is like, you know, look, he's a guy who from every every day of his life, from the day he started making money at all, he just plows into, into, the, into the next thing. Um, and so I think, I think money is definitely an enabler for satisfaction. I, let's put this way, money applied to happiness leads people down very dark paths. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very destructive avenues. Uh, money applied to satisfaction, I think, could be, is a real tool. Um, I always, by the way, I was like, uh, you know, Elon is the case study for behavior. But the other thing that that's always really made me think is Larry, Larry Page was asked one time what his approach to philanthropy was. And he said, oh, I'm just, my, my philanthropic plan is just give all the money to Elon. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh... 
Yeah. So the the core of it is he's a he's he's back to the future. So he he is he is doing the most leading edge things in the world, but with an with a really deeply old school approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to find comparisons to Elon, you need to go to like Henry Ford and Thomas Watson and Howard Hughes and Andrew Carnegie, right? Um, Lila Stanford. Um, John D. Rockefeller, right? You need to go to the what were called the bourgeois capitalists, like the hardcore business owner operators who basically built, you know, indus- basically built industrialized society. Um, Vanderbilt, um, and it's a level of hands-on commitment um, and uh, depth um, in the business, um, coupled with an absolute priority uh, towards truth um, and towards. Um, how to put it, science and technology uh, down to first principles. That is just like absolute, just, it's just like unbelievably absolute. Mm-hmm. He really is ideal that he's only ever talking to engineers. Like he does not tolerate bullshit. He has, he has mm-hmm. less bullshit tolerance than anybody I've ever met. Mm-hmm. Um, he wants ground truth on every single topic. Um, and he runs his businesses directly day to day, devoted to getting to ground truth on every single topic. So uh you think it was a good decision for him to buy Twitter? I have developed a view in life did not second guess Elon Musk. <laughs> I know this is going to sound cra- cra- crazy and unfounded, but well, I, I mean, to... uh, he's got a quite a track record. I mean, look, the car was a crazy. I mean, the car was. I mean, look, he's done a lot of things that seem crazy. Starting a new car company in the United States of America, the last time somebody really tried to do that was the 1950s, and it was called Tucker Automotive, and it was such a disaster. They made a movie about what a disaster it was. Um, and then rockets, like who does that? Like that's, there's obviously no way to start a new rocket company like those days are over. And then to do those at the same time. So after he pulled those two off, like, okay, fine. <laughs> like, like this is one of my areas of like, I, I, whatever opinions I had about that, that is just like, okay, clearly are not relevant. Like this is, you just, you, at some point you just like bet on the person. And in general, I wish more people would lean on celebrating and supporting versus deriding and destroying. Oh yeah. I mean, look, he drives resentment like it's it, like he, he is a magnet for resentment um like his critics are the most miserable like resentful people in the world like it's almost a perfect match of like the most idealized you know technologist you know of the century coupled with like just his critics are just bitter as can be I mean, it's it's i mean it's it's sort of very darkly uh comic to watch don't know the answer to that um i think the meaning of uh of uh the closest i get to it is what i said about satisfaction so it's basically like okay we were given what we have like we should basically do our best what's the role of love in that mix i mean like what's the point of life if you're yeah without love like yeah so love is a big part of that satisfaction and look like taking care of people is like a wonderful thing like you know a mentality you know there are pathological forms of taking care of people but there's also a very fundamental you know kind of aspect of taking care of people like for example i happen to be somebody who believes that capitalism and taking care of people are actually they're actually the same thing um somebody once said capitalism is how you take care of people you don't know Hmm. right um right and so like yeah i think it's like deeply woven into the whole thing um you know there's a long conversation to be had about that but yeah David Friedman says there's only three ways to get somebody to do something for somebody else. Love, money, and force. (laughs) Uh, um, Love and money are better. This is the Lex Free Podcast.